everyone, and welcome to um, our panel. My name is Kate Huntington, and I'm a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, and also a member of the course committee. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today, both in person and Kendra, once we can, uh, we, once we'll be able to hear you um, remotely. And so, um, as you know, as part of our statement of task for this committee, um, we were asked to explore opportunities for EAR to partner um, with different groups across NSF. Um, and we were also asked to identify infrastructure relevant to earth science research um, across the foundation. And so what we're really hoping is that today's discussion will help us better understand the landscape at NSF so we can get a sense for what partnerships already exist um, what opportunities might be out there to better leverage those existing partnerships or to form new partnerships um, and make new connections. And so um, I believe that Deb has asked you to begin with a brief presentation and some people have PowerPoints, others um, have um, remarks, both are great. Uh, and so I'd like to, what we'll do is um, we'll start with those and um, in particular the, the questions that or the presentations we were hoping would address some of the guiding questions that are provided in the printed booklet that we have for the agenda. And so uh, just to get right to it, I'll just, I'll say that the community input that the committee has gotten and that's on the public record has highlighted the need to cross the shoreline um, in particular and also to lower barriers between EAR and ocean sciences. And so what we'll do is we'll start our panel um, with remarks from ocean sciences and um, we'll aim for about 10 or 12 minutes, um, something like that. And then uh, five to seven minutes uh, for each of the other panelists as um, our, uh, as Deb has, uh, I think, sent you in advance. But first, I'd like to just start with an introduction of the panelists briefly. So um, we have Terry Quinn, professor at UT Austin, currently serving as director of the Division of Ocean Sciences. Um, also from the Division of Ocean Sciences, we have Candace Major, who's the lead program director in the Marine Geology and Geophysics program. We have Anjali um, Basmai, Director of the Division of Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences. We have Brandy Schottel, Associate Program Director for the Environmental Engineering and Sustainability Cluster in the Division of Chemical, Bioengineering, Environmental and Transport Systems, or CBET. CBET. I don't know if I pronounce the acronyms wrong. You'll have to. You'll have to. You'll have to educate me. You don't have sound bites on the website when you click on them to tell the. <laughs> tell the people in the other divisions. Um, next, we have um, joining us remotely um, Kendra McLaughlin, who's a professor at Kansas State University and program director in the Ecosystem Science Cluster in the Division of Environmental Biology, Biological Sciences Directorate, um, who's also involved with navigating the new Arctic and dimensions of biodiversity working groups at NSF. Then we also have um, Jessica Robin, who serves as the Countries and Regions Cluster Lead in the Office of International Science and Engineering um, and works in several other interdisciplinary working groups at NSF and has previously worked in the Geosciences Directorate. So um, more detailed bios are also available in the printed um, agenda and speakers, please feel free to share relevant information about yourself uh, as we go. Um, and so um, now we'll just give time for, our pre oh, look, we have is that Kendra. We, okay, we can see you now, Kendra. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Great. Hopefully you can hear us at all. Okay. Uh, so now we'll just get right to your presentations and your remarks, and then um, I'll moderate a discussion in which we can, uh, we may dig deeper onto some of the, the topics that you touch upon or that were in the guiding questions, and we'll open it, mostly just open it up to the committee for, for questions and discussion. Um, so if you're ready, could we get started with Ocean Sciences, please? And yes, please do use the microphones so that um, everyone listening in online can hear us. So apparently I passed the first test, I got the microphone to work, so that's always good. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Terry Quinn and I'm just uh, settling in on my one year anniversary uh, being Division Director of Ocean Sciences. And that usually means I know enough to get in trouble, so I'll try to stay out of trouble in, in my conversations today uh, for that. But I would like to say that, uh, I'll start off with a little sort of a, a broad overview. As the uh, Division Director in, the, in uh, the Geo Directorate, where we have Bill Easterling as the AD there, and uh, we are really uh, privileged and proud to be able to work with Anjali Bumzai 
from AGS and Lena Patina from EAR and Kelly Faulkner, who's uh, not here today. But I think the leadership team is actually a really strong one. We get along well. We have uh, robust and dynamic discussions amongst us. And there's a real spirit of, of collegiality and collaboration amongst the, uh, amongst the division directors. So I think there's a, a, a fertile fields to plow in these, in these areas where there's some natural areas, I think, and I'll talk about this in a second. But I also would like to uh, uh, let people know we just announced uh, uh, last week um, that Candace Major is, uh, has been uh, named the, the new um, section head for the Marine Geoscience section. So I'm really, uh, again, very proud to have Candace part of the uh, executive team in, in ocean sciences. And she joins uh, Bob Houtman uh, on the infrastructure side and, and Lisa Clow in the ocean sections, uh, uh, ocean sciences side for that. So. Um, yeah, so we're poised to do great things. I think there's a lots of really interesting, it's a great time to be at NSF uh, for, as, a, as a rotator. Um, I think in particular, my background, uh, I come from the Institute for Geophysics at the University of Texas, uh, although I'm a paleoceanographer and paleoclimatologist. Um, and so, uh, but that brings uh, a certain set of expertise and, and, and experience with me that I think it, it provides a nice dovetail with some of the things that you're, the, this course group is looking at. Geophysics is a, is a natural place that crosses the, uh, uh, the land sea divide, right? Uh, and so if you want to study seismology, you need to do it from, from all perspectives. And so you have great experience uh, uh, from leading the Institute for Geophysics for a long time. But then also paleoclimate. Right, another area where paleoclimate is reconstructed both from the ocean and the land. So there are natural areas in which uh, there are some interactions between EAR and OCE. And then there's uh, your geochemistry. And my background and training is, uh, you know, mass spectrometry. So uh, geochemistry is another one of those, whether you're measuring uh, isotopes in waters, uh, seawaters, or, or groundwaters, you're measuring in some, uh, some uh, sedimentary archive, uh, is another area that there's some natural areas where there's a, uh, some expertise to be done there. And also I spent a, a, a long time working in, uh, uh, in the, using coral reefs and so coastal environments are very important to me. Another area where I think there's natural uh, uh, collaborations between um, EAR and, and OCE. I know see Andrea's here, another a person who knows that very, very well in terms of being able to both reconstruct climate but sea level, for example, and using tectonics to help you understand uh, the role of sea level change. So I think in those four broad areas, there's just some real natural areas that we can interact, uh, EAR and OCE. And I know that Lena and I have uh, had a bunch of discussions and there's a, a burgeoning working group that's being developed by the program officers who have come together on their, on their own to sort of say, hey, with geoprisms winding down, what are the next steps? Where can EAR and OCE collaborate some more? And so, uh, again, um, a, a large group of P, uh, program officers got together sort of to drive this, and so we're just in the nascent stages of that. But again, a great opportunity for, uh, for things to come together, and I'm excited to work with Lena uh, and others in EAR uh, for that. And then we, I would be remiss if I didn't mention COPE, you know, Coastlines and People. Uh, again, a, a, a new investment uh, at NSF into areas that, again, are in the sort of the, the gray water areas, but also very importantly, bringing in the impacts of, of people, so science-informed uh, uh, policy uh, decision-making, for example. And, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, Jim knows this, uh, who had this job a number of years ago, sort of blue water oceanography was sort of the, uh, you know, the mainstay of, 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 of OCE. But now, the, uh, with the investment in the regional class research vessels, three are going to be coastal vessels uh, run by Oregon State University, one out the Tani, which is out on the West Coast, and the Resolution, which is from the East Coast uh, Consortium uh, for that. And then we have a, uh, the, the uh, competition for the third one just closed in July 1st, and so we will, we will be looking at that. So again, NSF is making large investments uh, in areas that are of interest to actually cross this sort of land-sea divide, if you will. So that's what excites me. One of the reasons to come to NSF was for that actual reason, so to work together across this, uh, uh, this divide, because it's a uh, the Earth system doesn't really know the divide. Uh, we tend, from both an academic standpoint, in our home institutions of silos of excellence versus NSF, where also we have uh, 
similar silos of excellence uh, with slightly different names, uh, but the challenges are also uh, there for that. So uh, I'm excited to work together uh, with, with folks. Uh, we've already uh, done a bit of that and historically for, through OCE and, and EAR. And uh, so I'm happy to answer additional questions as we move forward. I think at this point I'd like to maybe pass it on to, to Candace and she, she, she had a few remarks. Okay. Is there any way to get the um, figure up? So I might, uh, I'll just expand on some of the, the um, things that Terry said with some more specifics about uh, investments we've made in the recent past between um, EAR and OC and also some of the joint programs that you may have heard about already. Um, so there, the MG and G marine geology and geophysics is probably the greatest, the biggest partner in um, for EAR in the ocean sciences, but it is by no means the only partner. Um, so I, I wanted to put this up because the structure of ocean sciences is a little different from earth sciences, but we do have uh, four science programs. Um, they're they're rather large, broad programs. Uh, they are split into two sections, and it's a little hard to see here, but um, there is a biological oceanography program, physical oceanography um, that are part of the ocean section, and then uh, marine geology and phys geophysics and chemical oceanography that are, that are the marine geosciences section. And then there is a third section that deals with facilities, uh, the ship operations and all the associated um, tools and, and instrumentation. So um, the marine geology program where I've been for about 11 years now is the one on the far left. We have four program directors in that program. And the two big uh, longstanding programs that are partnerships with EAR sit within that core program. They are not separate programs, but they are part of the marine ge geology and geophysics core program. Those are geoprisms. Um, and the Paleo Perspectives on Climate Change program. And um, both of those are uh, decadal programs that are coming toward their end. And um, they will be, uh, Geoprisms I believe has one more uh, competition and uh, P2C2 maybe two more competitions. Those will be reviewed the, the, and um, the, the future of, of where those communities go is, is up for discussion right now. It's, um, it's likely that new programs will evolve or those will be uh, reverted into the core programs. So that's a discussion. In terms of specific investments, um, those have, there have been a number uh, in the solid earth uh, on the solid earth side, uh, much of it through geoprisms, big investments in subduction zone science. Uh, the Cascadia Initiative involved uh, large arrays of uh, ocean bottom and terrestrial seismometers um, to look at structures of, of the subduction zone um, in the Pacific Northwest. Similarly, we have an, uh, a, an experiment that's out right now in the Aleutians and also uh, a similar scale of experiments in Hikarangi in New Zealand. So uh, all of those are big. All of them involve both offshore and onshore components. And um, some of that has been done through geoprisms. Much of it has been done through geoprisms as some of their focus sites. But a huge amount of it has been supported through the core programs in EAR and ocean sciences. So. Um, I know we're pretty much at our 10 minutes right now and we've barely scratched the surface of the first question. So I hope that we'll be able to come back to some of the other ones so we can move this along. But I did want to mention it um, before passing it to Anjali that um, we have recently assembled a working group of program directors in OCE and EAR to talk about some of the process and topical challenges to working um, across the divisions. We, um, we do feel that, uh, you know, these large experiments that, that we've supported over decades really demonstrate our interest and willingness to work across the shoreline. Um, there are some 
challenges like uh, the infrastructure that we use, both the, the ships in ocean sciences, um, big community centers like IRIS and UNAVCO, um, and the SAGE Engage Awards on the, on the EAR side. But we are actively pursuing, um, you know, better ways of, of um, working through these partnerships and supporting the science that, that crosses the shoreline. So, uh, so we can come back to this. I know we have until about 1215, right, for this discussion. So we can revisit the other questions. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so let's hear from Anjali. Uh, yeah, could somebody pull up my presentation? Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, happy to be here. I recall I was here on a previous occasion for the sea change report, you know, which was OCE. So, so AGS at the service of EAR now. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, give you an idea of the baseline of what our interactions are thus far, and then maybe speculate something uh, on what might we have, where we might uh, further strengthen our interactions. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about some of the jointly funded projects with the AGS programs, and then there's a, a NCARS WARF hydro modeling system that we've uh, worked uh, at our National Center, National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is a, one of the sections in our uh, in AGS. And then there are geo-wide interactions. You heard about P2C2, Candice just mentioned that. And then we've also worked with EAR colleagues on uh, PREVENTS, which was a divisional-wide, rather uh, geo-wide uh, activity. And then there are interactions on the educational efforts, the REU uh, in particular. We also interact with uh, EAR colleagues on cross directorate slash NSF-wide activities. Uh, for example, INFUSE, which was innovations at the nexus of food, energy, water systems. Tom Torgerson and Chungu Lu were actually the co-chairs and they worked actively towards this most recent competition. Uh, the awards have been made, I guess. There's also a couple natural human systems where GEO, BIO, and SBE make awards, which are at the interface of uh, GEO, EAR oftentimes. And of course, we have the NSF NSF 10 big ideas and three of them are, uh, I think, relevant for our interactions with EAR and uh, the awards are going to be made later this summer, so we'll see how uh, PI is fared. You know, NSF is a very uh, community-driven organization, so the ideas are reviewed. And so whilst we like to take strategic long-term views, it's also the community has to be, uh, we have to have buy-in from the community. Next slide. So I'm going to focus mainly on the uh, top thing, the AGS EAR. So I starting out with the org chart, we have three sections in uh, AGS. We have the atmosphere section, the NCAR and facilities section, and the geospace section. And in uh, wherever I looked at the, uh, I searched the database and I looked for more than one award jointly made with any of the programs. And so you will find that with black. So you, and black is uh, where we have good robust interactions, which is with physical and dynamic metrology, climate large scale dynamics, uh, education and interdisciplinary activities. And when I have the dotted line or the dashed line, it's where it's kind of modest. So we don't have, uh, but we've had at least one co-funded project in the past decade, which isn't much, but nevertheless, there have been some ideas that have um, resonated with the uh, reviewers as well as with the program officers and they've gone forward. Uh, P2C2, we have a we have an independent dedicated program called paleoclimate in uh, the atmosphere section. Now the paleoclimate program is mainly about uh, reconstructions of proxies and the instrumental period or climate dynamic studying just mainly, or oh, the proxy period, sorry, 2K, after 2K they go. And with P2C2 it goes further back and we also, it's also placed within the context of contemporary climate. And of course I'm sure that some of you in the room would have been P2C2 PI, so you know, I'm preaching to the, or, you know, to the choir here. And then with NCAR, uh, there's recently been, uh, in partnership with NOAA, uh, NSF has, NCAR uh, has uh, developed the weather research forecast hydro modeling system, and it's actually been operationalized to the National Water Center at Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So it's a resource for the EAR community, those that are working on uh, hydroclimate issues, hydro weather, et cetera. Next slide. 
oh, we can skip this one. Yeah, let's just skip this one. So yeah, uh, towards building a geo-wide REU community. So there is a concerted effort by POs in ALT, uh, AGS, EAR, and OCE. Every other year, uh, joint PI meetings are held, and one of the divisions takes the leadership uh, for organizing the PI meeting for the REU PIs. There's, uh, they're also setting up a resource center for the PIs and co-mentoring a summer intern to kind of analyze the data from the REU sites. And also uh, the program officers want to send consistent guidance about the expectations for the REU sites. And so there's some kind of uh, quite a robust collaboration. And I think it goes back to the days when Lena was working on the uh, you know, educational activities. Next one. So, yeah, so these are the science themes that uh, I've got on the left, I've got EAR co-funding with AGS and then AGS co-funding with EAR, so which are the programs that take the lead. And uh, when I've got it in bold, it means there's uh, substantial funding. And if it's like one or two projects, you know, I've left it uh, without uh, highlighting in bold black. And the science themes that have uh, typically been funded are hydrometrology, uh, hydroclimate, flooding, uh, particularly in the urban environment, land surface coupling, drought, um, you know, excess uh, uh, flooding due to hurricanes. And on the longer time scales, there's also been some very interesting uh, projects which are looking at climate dynamics, the lessons or the insights we have from contemporary climate dynamics and applying it to the deep paleo record. So Tibetan Plateau Uplift, we did a, a very interesting project co-funded with climate large scale dynamics and uh, continental dynamics, dynamics, I think was the name of the program at that point. Uh, there's also interesting uh, projects on trace gas emissions from uh, seismic activity. So we recently uh, just uh, launched a rapid, so there was a, some, uh, a volcano and someone wanted to study the trace, send, send the measurements and see what, how it, that works. I think that might be the last one. Yeah, so summary, we have substantial bilateral interactions and then there's the WOLF hydro modeling system. It's of interest to EARPIs. We have a standing partnership on P2C2 as well as the REU uh, uh, activity. And there's modest interactions with aeronomy, magnetospheric physics and atmospheric chemistry. Yeah, and I've got a list actually, if you go to the next one, which more detail. So that's back up for you. Yeah. Thank you. And everyone is keeping exactly perfectly on time within 30 seconds. I'm so impressed. Um, <laughs> so next, if we could uh, hear from Brandy. Yeah. And I have slides too, although if you can't find them, they're not horribly necessary. So, okay, so there they are. All right. So go ahead. You can go to the first or the second slide. You all know who I am. So uh, I'm Brandy Shottle. I am a uh, Program Director in CBET. I won't spell out the name for you anymore. You did write CBET. Uh, in the Engineering Directorate. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little overview of engineering. Uh, we actually have six divisions in engineering, and believe it or not, there is a lot of overlap with GEO programs. I'm here representing CBET, one of our three core divisions right now, uh, and again, by no means the only overlap. Uh, we may have the most overlap uh, in our unsolicited programs due to the cluster that I am in. Uh, uh, but I'm going to highlight a couple of cross-directorate initiatives that we either have in the past or are ongoing right now or even in the future. So, um, yeah, please, next slide. So here's my division. Uh, we have 16 core programs arranged into four clusters. Uh, the cluster I'm going to focus on is the third one uh, from the left for you all, uh, the Environmental Engineering and Sustainability Cluster that has three core programs plus two extra program directors here. Um, the two core programs that probably work the most uh, across GEO are with them the most are environmental engineering and environmental sustainability. Uh, within the past five or six years, environmental engineering has uh, exploded in size and become very multidisciplinary. Uh, we have a lot of overlap with atmospheric chemistry in many cases, um, as well as throughout chemistry and EAR. Same thing with environmental sustainability, which is a highly interdisciplinary program. Um, I want to point out there to uh, Jim Jones, who is the engineering co-chair, along with Tom Torgerson of Infuse. Uh, 
Infuse actually was every single director in NSF plus USDA NIFA. Uh, the co-chair designation I almost feel like is a punishment to those who are co-chairs, any of you who have ever done these things. Uh, and I've slipped into this role as well. However, that uh, initiative is winding down. We just finished our last competition and we're working on the awards. Um, and I believe it's scheduled to end in 2020, if I'm not mistaken. So please, next slide. So one of my roles in CBED is, since I don't run a core program, I actually tend to run all of our cross-directorate uh, initiatives, particularly when they touch environmental sustainability. We re recently hired similar people like me in the other clusters, uh, but up until recently I was the person, so it's kind of nice to have the pass off there. And I also uh, run all of our international programs in CBET and in some cases for all of engineering. And it's rather interesting, a lot of them are crossing over with some of our GEO initiatives. Uh, Signals in the Soil started a year ago. Uh, GEO has been a major partner in this. This is actually when it started, it was four directorates, engineering, bio, size, and GEO. And then we had uh, USDA NIFA was part of it as well. Um, and you'll notice here I have this proposed multi-directorate, multi-agency initiative. Uh, that actually happened this year, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we had a large workshop to kind of inform us on this idea. This fell out of Infuse, the idea that a lot of our soil models are really outdated and our methods for testing soil um, are really static. You go into the ground and you pull up stuff and you take it back to the lab and then you test it. And so it wasn't keeping up with some of the things that they needed it to do in Infuse as well as some other initiatives. And so we had a DCL last year with the four uh, directorates I mentioned calling for eager and raise awards on four major teams. We need novel sensors that can dynamically measure multiple properties at once. They need to be low power self-calibrating because you want to leave them in ground. They also need to be able to send signals wirelessly through heterogeneous media. There's all kinds of problems with this. And then, of course, when you're collecting that kind of data dynamically, you have major data problems and data analytics issues. And of course, how are you going to put these into new models and then make decision support tools for modeling entire ecosystems? So uh, I do have a link there to the list of the awards. Uh, however, also that year with GEO, and this is with IIP, that Industrial Innovation and Partnerships Directorate, we had a DCL out, and it's still current, uh, calling for planning grants for industry, university, and cooperative research centers on signals in the soil topics. And size and GEO are also a partner on that, and that continued this year as well. So next slide, please. Uh, this year, we had those four directorates plus USDA NIFA officially, as well as four research councils of the United Kingdom involved in the signals in the soil solicitation, which we're currently also wrapping up for this year. Uh, we added one more theme. We're looking at signals between species in soil as well, so there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, but it was open game for whoever could come up with ideas. And so we plan on continuing that next year. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, I'm not going to steal the thunder on a lot of this. There's a lot of programs listed here. So NSF is mo moving towards urban systems and communities in the 21st cent century is a is somewhat new initiative that's cross-cutting across the foundation. Uh, there's a We have a website that talks about all these different programs. I've got a link here. Uh, there's four of them listed here, two of them that are already ongoing and two that are emerging. Um, I know Bill is going to talk about coastlines and people uh, extensively tomorrow. Uh, but I am going to give a shout out to Sustainable Urban Systems, which GEO is also a part of. Uh, we are planning to launch this next year. We have no idea what this is going to look like. Uh, this is based on uh, some interactions with the community as well, again, as stuff that came out of uh, Infuse, uh, Risk and Resilience, and some of the other data that was telling us that this is going to be really important in the future. Right now, we're in the process of putting on roughly 20 to 27 workshops this summer. I've got a link there to all the workshop awards right now that the community is going to help us help inform us on what shape this needs to take. And so there also could potentially be a lot of community partners as well involved in that. And I think there's a lot of overlap between COPE and SUS as well out there, along with the uh, LTER here that we have in smart and connected communities. So next slide, please. 
And then the final one I want to mention, this is a past international opportunity. Uh, we typically like to renew this one every year because it's with NSFC, NSF China. Uh, it's topically related, and this is a direct collaboration with uh, GOEAR where uh, we promote international collaboration between U.S. and Chinese researchers uh, where they go undergo separate review processes, but we make the final decision together on specific topics of importance to environmental sustainability, one of our core programs, and uh, hydrologic sciences and GOEAR. Uh, we've run it for the past two years now with GEO. Um, we're assuming the topic may be the same. We may add another topic. It rotates, but it's just another example of some of the international opportunities there as well. And I think I'll stop there. So, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, could we uh, get Kendra back and hear from her? Hey, um, sometimes hey. phone audio. Can everyone hear me okay? That's yeah. much better, thank you. We can hear you. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, so I don't have any slides, and I'm going to essentially go through um, your questions in, in exact order that you presented them. Thank you. Um, so I am representing the bio directorate today. Um, we have four divisions. I don't have an org chart for you, but... Um, I am in the Division of Environmental Biology. Um, that has 20 program officers, about 15 staff, um, and we're led uh, by Division Director and Deputy Division Director um, that we, you know, feeling pretty good about our leadership at the moment also. Um, I'm in the Ecosystem Science Cluster. That's one of four clusters in the Division of Environmental Biology. Um, and within that cluster, I'm one of five program officers. Um, and we really work as a unit. Um, I'd like to just kind of say our culture is uh, one of teamwork and uh, communication. Uh, we have a lot of workflows, a lot of protocols, a lot of standardized procedures, um, and we are really efficient due to our proposal load. So um, these are some things that struck me coming from a university workplace, um, and I think within NSF, um, we do have a reputation for being um, really organized and team-oriented. Um, so about the first question about like just what earth science research is supported um, by our um, division, I can't take the time right now to name all the earth science research um, supported. It would just take too long. Um, but certainly within our cluster, within ecosystem science, there's quite a bit um, because we study material and energy flow in the biosphere and and abiotic components as well. So. Um, we work with the EAR programs quite a bit um, in terms of soil, um, water, occasional atmospheric fluxes, and things like that. Um, and then within the uh, division, all four of our units um, do co-review quite a bit with EAR programs. So the main mechanism of interaction between ecosystem science and EAR programs is co-review of unsolicited programs, or sorry, unsolicited proposals to core programs. So as I'll explain in a minute, we have a pretty good mechanism for this type of collaboration. A couple of other people have referred to, you know, the kind of lifeblood of NSF is these investigator-driven proposals. Um, and that's really how we interact the most right now. Um, there's certainly a variety of potential interactions to face emerging questions. Um, a model for this moving ahead might be some of the other co-funded programs that were mentioned, such as Coupled Natural Human Systems, or the long-term ecological research network um, that various um, parts of GEO um, kind of pay into and have also, you know, kind of jointly uh, developed with um, bio program officers. Another opportunity for EAR bio partnerships coming up, I think, is around the new solicitation for the macro systems program. Um, macro systems um, is a program that's been going on for about um, six, seven years in bio, and we're really trying to think about its future. Um, we've seen a lot of interest from uh, geo PAIs, um, and since Earth, Earth systems play a prominent role in continental scale uh, dynamics, I think it could be relatively easy to figure out a way to formalize this partnership um, to mutual benefit. I'll talk a little bit more about macro systems and NEON um, in a little bit. Um, about the second question, um, what specific EAR-supported infrastructure 
do our PIs currently use? This was an extremely telling question because when I floated this around um, my group uh, in ecosystems and in DEB, we were really stumped. You know, it just nothing kind of sprang to mind. Uh, and I think this was really telling. I was like, where would we even go to find a list of EAR supported infrastructure? Um, you know, I can search the award database as well as anyone else. Um, but we were kind of struggling um, to kind of find a unified list of this infrastructure code that, you know, we might use to try to identify what EAR um, infrastructure was being used. Um, I do know just anecdotally in the last couple of years um, that we RPIs have used, um, we've been happy to support in some cases um, radiocarbon facilities, certainly ecological radiocarbon. Um, RPIs make use of a sediment coring facility um, called LATCOR, um, and we certainly interact strongly with the CZO uh, network. Um, so just to kind of throw a few examples out from the last couple of years, I do know there's also cyber infrastructure that's used, um, the geo-supported cyber infrastructure uh, that's used by um, some of our PIs. But I'd like to also kind of turn this question on its head and say um, that now BIO has its first facility, which is NEON. Um, BIO does not have a long history of facilities um, like GEO does, but um, but we now do have our first facility, and I have a few ideas at the end I'd like to throw out for how EAR could partner with us on that. Um, the third question is about the relative value um, that we place on interdisciplinary versus our core programs. And I would say, I mean, it's hard to know what to measure or quantify to get at this, but uh, I would say this is extremely high value on interdisciplinary programs. Um, it's variable from year to year but it's almost equal, um, I would say, between core and its interdisciplinary. I base that um, partly on publicly available data on co-funding. Our program uh, co-funds um, between 10 and 30% of our proposals. So obviously co-review um, is, is obviously higher. Um, and further, PO time. So um, each program officer in ecosystems is on one or two, um, in one case, three cross-cutting programs, as well as the core ecosystem program. So many of us in bio have served on and invested quite a bit of time in the programs mentioned by others, including COPE, SITS, um, CNH, Navigating a New and other programs. Barriers are the time and energy to plan and build new initiatives while you're kind of managing your workload and the proposals coming in. Um, and I will say because of the big ideas at the moment, um, a lot of us have been pretty flat out um, working on those ideas. It's been hard to kind of carve out additional initiatives. Um, additionally, I do think that the leadership kind of plans initiatives at the directorate level, and I'm not sure how much communication there is um, among um, ADs or assistant directors of each um, each unit. Um, the mechanisms we use to find out about new initiatives, um, I'll say there's a fair amount of physical separation in the building, um, but we do communicate pretty well uh, via email. Um, we use a lot of brown bags um, or invited speakers within the agency, and people are pretty good. Um, certainly EAR program officers are great about reaching out to us when there's something like that. Um, we do, I think, have good communication um, between bio and EAR program officers. Um, you know, friendships, collaboration, we're on the same working groups. Um, sometimes we do run into each other in the cafeteria, so there's a fair amount of communication. I'd say another, um, like, way that we find out about programs in EAR is sometimes PIs contact us. Um, and it's the first we've heard of a new initiative, and that happened this year with Frontier Research and Earth Sciences, the FREZ initiative. Um, at AGU, it was a bit of a surprise when some of our um, PIs said, oh, well, there's a, a bit in this solicitation where there's a formal request to um, program officers and other directorates or divisions to get written approval um, for co-review. And we thought, wow, okay, that's interesting. So. Um, that was an area where that kind of caught us by surprise, and it was our PIs who communicated that to us. Um, obstacles for collaboration. 
Um, just more communication, I think. Again, I think communication is good um, at the moment, but it could be improved with additional opportunities. Um, I think building in communication opportunities um, would be useful. Um, and we have seen the, the PI community kind of organizing around, we saw a workshop last year around um, networking of the networks or kind of what's the similarities and differences among LTER, CZO, and NEON um, as networks. That was an interesting um, workshop. Um, finally, about international collaborations and asset sharing. So Brandy, you know, covered this really, really well. They've been on the forefront of some of this international stuff. I will say um, my own experience with um, international stuff that I've seen developed and maintained in DEB has been a cautionary tale. Um, we also have a program with NSFC of uh, China. Um, this, this is a Dimensions of Biodiversity program. We've worked very, very hard to develop these MOUs with these um, agencies in China, South Africa, and Brazil. Um, creating and maintaining these partnerships is very, very difficult. Um, GEOs joined us on, on these programs um, through at least biological oceanography over the years. Um, but it's really hard to trust the other agencies' review process and as, as Brandy alluded, make the joint funding um, decisions that can be, there's a lot of trust involved there. Um, I don't have any particular recommendations for where EAR could build international collaborations like this, um, but just to kind of say it's a lot of work, but it can pay off um, for truly international questions. And I'll just close by saying there's a clear and logical opportunity for EAR to share the asset of NEON. Um, Again, this, this um, was a huge NSF investment, almost half a billion dollars in building um, this network, the National Ecological um, Observing Network. Um, it is only in the U.S., so that's one issue, um, but it just provides this opportunity, I think, for um, EAR PIs and, and possibly um, the EAR program um, to think about these continental scale questions types of sensor and technology work, the kind of data interoperability and democratization that we've seen in other programs. So um, I will leave it there um, and we can pick anything back up you'd like later. Thank you very much. Um, so last but not, not least, um, we look forward to hearing from Jessica. Okay. So um, hello, it's a pleasure to be here to discuss partnerships. I've been at NSF uh, almost 12 years now. And so in addition to my work in international, I did spend three years in the Division of Earth Sciences where I managed the Geomorphology Land Use Dynamics Program. I also worked on critical zone observatories. It was very nice to catch up with Bill on what's going on with his CZO. Um, I also spent time on detail in the Mathematical Physical Sciences Directorate working on their large facilities. So I, I'm going to to um, focus my remarks a bit on international and then some lessons learned because I have been involved with a couple of these cross-foundational interdisciplinary initiatives, CEAS, the sustainability initiative, which really was a precursor to some of the programs we see now, such as COPE, Infuse, Navigating the New Arctic, Prevents. Um, I've also been involved with the RAISE mechanism. So that's, that's a mechanism to support high-risk, high-reward interdisciplinary research at NSF. And then I've been involved in the big ideas um, on convergence. So regarding international, OSC, our, our office, is really the focal point of international activities at NSF, and we're located within the office of the director. So that gives us a unique vantage point across the foundation. And what we do is we represent NSF's intersection of uh, science and foreign policy, and then we also identify opportunities for international so science cooperation and help the directorates make those partnerships. And so some of the ones that you just heard regarding China, Brazil, South Africa, uh, the UK. We work very closely on those. We work really closely on those agreements. I think some of the points that Kendra raised in terms of how do you manage these uh, joint programs, it's, 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 it's not always so um, intuitive and easy. So we spend quite a bit of time on that. But we also have some programs in OISE, and I want to highlight those because I think they provide really rich opportunities for the EAR community. Now, many of you might be familiar with our 
our flagship program, PIRE, Partnerships for International Research and Education. And this, uh, the goal of PIRE is really to support high quality projects which advance research and education that could not occur without the international collaboration. Now these are really large five year awards, usually on average of four and a half million dollars. Many of these are interdisciplinary and they leverage the expertise of all the international partners involved in the particular project. Now, the program started in 2005. We've supported over 75 projects across all NSF uh, disciplinary programs. And I want to emphasize that all of our pro um, solicitations are for any part of NSF. Now, with that said, uh, EAR has had a very large disciplinary footprint in those 75 awards. I would say that all of the core programs of EAR have been represented in at least one, if not more, of those projects. Um, additionally, they span the entire globe, okay? And, and many of these projects tend to be multiple countries. So I think EAR has done a very good job in that program. Uh, the, the solicitation is currently being revised with a release in 2021. We usually run that program every two years. Um, now, another program we have is our IRIS program, International Research and Education for Students program, which I would really encourage the community to look more closely at because we've revised this program quite a bit. Um, it supports active research partnerships by undergraduate and graduate um, students in high quality international research education and professional development experiences. Um, we, this is an annual solicitation. We have three tracks and the, the awards range from 150 50,000 up to a million dollars. Now the track one is our traditional track. It's very much like an international RU, but you have options to include graduate students. Uh, we have a track two now, which are um, short-term advanced studies courses um, targeted for advanced graduate students. And then we have a track three. Um, this is our largest awards of up to a million dollars. And what this is, is really looking at uh, supporting institutional collaborations to develop Develop, implement um, innovative models for high impact large scale international research and professional de development targeted at U.S. graduate students. And then our third program is um, our newest program. This is ExcelNet, Accelerating Research Through International Network-to-Network -network Collaborations. How's that for a mouthful? Um, this aims to foster networks of networks collaborations, creating links between multiple networks, and I want to stress the multiple part, that cross international boundaries to, ex to accelerate scientific discoveries. Now, the program leverages expertise, data, facilities, and or resources to stimulate critical research advances. Now these networks can vary in size and maturity, but most, but must consist beyond an individual network. So this is how they are a bit unique from the RCN uh, program that may, many of you might be familiar with. And they must have or will have in the course of the project develop uh, protocols for communication, collaboration, data management, intellectual property, shared use infrastructure, and other network activities, facilities, or products that reduce barriers for international collaboration. So I think this really touches on what some of the other panelists have talked about in terms of difficulties when we do international collaboration. Now this year is our first, comp uh, first competition. We're in the process of making these awards. And um, the next competition will start in October. And I was listening in on yesterday's panel on cyber infrastructure and EarthCube, right? And I, and I think um, one of the points that was raised was the different access to data and data standards across countries, right? And so, you know, Excel that was specifically designed to tackle these sorts of questions and um, I would really urge the community to look at this program because I think this could be a real opening for many of the things that were discussed yesterday. So um, hopefully I still have a couple minutes. I'm trying to talk real fast. Um, I, I just want to uh, close with some lessons learned from an external evaluation that we did related to the CIS um, initiative. Now, um, for those of you who might not be as familiar with CIS, it was established in two, uh, 2010 with the overall mission to advance science, engineering, education related to sustainability, right? The, the uh, initiative was motivated by several National Science Board, um, NRC, as well as advisory committee reports. 
And the geoscience directorate, with very active involvement from EAR, played a leadership role in the foundation for this initiative. Now, it spanned eight years, right? So this is a bit longer than most of our initiatives, and it ended in uh, 2017. And it was a total investment of $980 million. I'm not sure if everybody realizes that because it was 17 different cross-foundational programs that we had, okay? And like I said, many of these have continued on through these newer um, initiatives. Now, so, so two, two sort of closing remarks in terms of lessons learned from CIS that I think um, many of my panelists will say uh, will concur and, and, and it sort of follows some of their comments is that um, language matters, right? And so with CIS, uh, the solicitation language and the review criteria, which we spent a lot of time working on, so it was consistent across all these programs, really played a pivotal role in the composition of the research teams we funded, the integration of the, those research teams, the network building, and the stakeholder engagement. But on the flip side, the community reports really played a pivotal role in how we designed the programs. And so we do really uh, listen to what the community he says in terms of the needs of the foundation. And then the second point is regarding workload, which I think has come up time and time again. So the impl implementation of CEASE was challenging, and I know many of my colleagues in the room remember quite well uh, that experience, um, due to the, the, the increased workload on the program officers involved and the new programmatic structure that required these coordination across multiple directorates. I mean, I often joke that sometimes it's easier to work with the international collaborators than uh, across the NSF directorates, you know, because it just, it's very different structures and how we run our programs. Um, so I would say positive steps is like Brandy's position in engineering, where she is solely focused on these cross-foundational and international um, types of programs, whereas with CIS, what we were having, our program officers run their core programs, and in addition, these competitions. So it created a lot of extra work. And so I do think as the uh, NSF is moving forward, we've really learned some lessons and we're looking at different ways to organize ourselves. And I would, I would really watch the Convergence Accelerator space and see where that leads in terms of how we structure ourselves for these very big initiatives moving forward. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'm furiously scribbling up. Um, <laughs> So uh, thank you to all the panelists for laying out the landscape for us. And now I'd like to, I'd like to just start by uh, opening it up to questions from the panel. Please wave your name flags if I don't see you. <laughs> okay. okay. Carolina, please. Yes, uh, uh, Carolina Lasco Bertolani, UCL. I am a member of the committee. Um, I guess I want to thank you for coming. I found that really uh, uh, sort of enlightening. And uh, in particular, I've come back to the US uh, from the UK after 10 years in the UK. And I think I'd like to say that there's nothing comparable to NSF anywhere else. And the quality of NSF programs, cross cutting, thinking, connection to the community is really quite unique. And I just wanted to put that out there. Um, because NERC, for example, it's kind of a horrible agency. But, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, squash it out from the record. <laughs> uh, right, so my question is actually for the OCE. I actually have a question for OCE and then AGS. In terms of OCE, you, you talked, uh, you answered a lot of our questions in terms of cross, uh, not cross directed, but um, yeah, cross direct, whatever. <laughs> uh, it, it sort of uh, collaborations at the sea land boundary, right? And I, I guess, uh, you know, given sort of the community input that we've had and the next sort of big stage of trying to understand the Earth and Earth's interior, uh, or even things that are related to the big problems coming up in terms of large. Uh, sort of, you know, large earthquakes or great earthquakes that happen, you know, the subduction zone science where you've invested uh, sort of a lot of money. Do you see any other challenges or any other opportunities in sort of that collaboration that become more organic just than just co-funding or breaking down any sort of bureaucratic or issues that, you know, come at the boundary of this sea land uh, device? 
yeah, thanks for the, for the question. I, I think part of it is the uh, the understanding that we, the desire to break down those boundaries, right? We actually want to get less stovepiped. And so the this working group, that nation working group that's being developed is a great example of that. We want to hear input from the community through the program officers and to define what these next priorities might be. So, if, for example, what's going to come after your prisons? You know, that's a community decision, uh, decision to sort of communicate to, uh, to NSF for us to sort of uh, to think about. But there's lots of sort of uh, um, opportunities to go there. And I think some of these experiments that, you're, what, that we've done either on Hikarangi or Cascadia are great examples of these sort of collaborations that can be continued into the future uh, with that. So I think there are some good examples to pull from. And I think the community is poised to sort of continue to uh, to try to work together and work poised to sort of work together to make that happen within the foundation. So you're safe for the, being one yes. a community. Yeah. Okay. yeah, maybe I'll just add to that. And, and I was going to mention SC4D, no. but that, so I think the, um, the point there is that we, we don't have a solution, but we, we very much want to work with the community to find out what the priorities are so that we can figure out a way to implement them. And um, so SC4D, um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of uh, meetings and conversations with community members over the last couple of years, and um, they, we keep stressing that what, what we want is, is for them to evolve the concept of, like, what do you really want? And it's still kind of coalescing. And so there's an iterative process between the community stating needs and priorities um, and NSF helping to shape how we actually implement those. So it's, it's a back and forth um, conversation. Um, there are, you know, there are certainly some uh, priorities that have been stated by both the ocean sciences and earth sciences communities. The thing that has come up in pretty much every single one of those meetings over the last few years is the need for seafloor geodesy. Um, we have uh, a fairly well-developed um, process for offshore seismic um, you know, ocean bottom seismometers and a lot of those big experiments are were onshore offshore seismic experiments, but we don't really have a facility scale solution for uh, geodesy at this point. And so we've heard that, and now our challenge is to implement that. We don't we don't have a solution yet, but uh, we are we are working on it. So. And if I could ask a question of AGS, it's more of uh, sort of amusing. I, you said that the sort of collaborations between EAR and AGS on the issue of magnetospheric physics and things like that are, you know, are sort of moderate uh, to mild. But there are areas that I think become very important in the future, perhaps also with engineering, related to the generation of the magnetic field and the evolution of the magnetic field and the interaction between what's internally generated uh, with, you know, sort of what's, uh, you know, coming from the sun or, or whatever, and the impact of that on technology. So do you envision that, you know, those collaborations may grow, that you may integrate a little bit with, you know, innovative engineering because of communication issues that may come up in the future? Right. I had, uh, I glossed over our, uh, the largest uh, FFRDC that NSF has, which is NCAR, which is in our division. And at NCAR, we have uh, several activities, one of them being the community earth system modeling, which has several working groups. And there's a land uh, modeling working group, there's an atmosphere modeling working group, there's an ocean modeling working group, um, there's uh, applications. So if you, you know, and hydrology was considered one of the initial uh, applications in that working group. So taking it uh, to, uh, for decision making, you know, robust uh, science for decision making. So uh, in addition to the CESM activity, we also have an Earth Observing Laboratory at NCAR uh, through where, uh, which our field campaigns take place. And we've worked in the past with uh, field campaigns with OCE, act, uh, so they may bring their ships, their assets, and we have our airplanes, et cetera, at NCAR, which go to the field. But coming back more directly to your question, yes, indeed. Um, in the uh, CESM, there's an attempt uh, to uh, go up 
you know, in the vertical beyond the stratosphere with the whole atmosphere model, include atmospheric chemistry, and then all the way the aspirational goal is actually to go, you know, way above, like perhaps from sun to earth, and then study some of the phenomena. So coupling of uh, this. Right now we're not there yet, so the geospace uh, science community has its own set of models. I think they work closely with NASA on these, so the ionosphere, uh, modeling the ionosphere. So some of you may know the CEDAR, GEM and SHINE communities, they have their workshop so they're getting that part and eventually there will be a coupling with the lower atmosphere so the aspirational goal is indeed to look at the integrated atmosphere and if I may say the integrated earth system as well okay 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 um, I have a sort of two-part question is it, because our theme here is the collaboration of EAR with across the directorate and um, I heard two models and I wanted to get a feeling amongst you of the, the weight of those two. One is the individual PI says I want to work across and the other is somehow a program happens and the reputation of the individual PI is commonly slaughter that is, you, you put in a proposal and you go to that panel and they say, this is not enough biology, and you go to that panel, it's not enough hydrology. And I think um, that's a common experience that I can understand because, you know, we have our differing expertise that affects our outcomes. So there's a reviewing question there that I'm curious whether you've struggled with at all. And then the second thing is it seemed like a solution has been to try to find these programs where you have separate review because you have a common interest. Um, and the question I have is, uh, there is, how do you decide on these programs? I, mean, I don't know where Prevents came from, for example, and it's going away. Um, what's, how do you do this? Uh, I know you listen to the community, but in the end, the, you have to decide on um, uh, how many programs you're going to have. And um, where, does the, where does that come from? So I realize it's somewhat philosophical, but we actually need to hear this in terms of what recommendations we can make. So, well, there's several. So, in engineering, it actually happens a lot uh, because engineering has its hands in all the different sciences as well. And so, a lot of our divisions are already interdisciplinary. And we even have problems within our own division about proposals that sit on one that could easily sit on more than one panel. Uh, in our division, we do co-panels. Sometimes it's easy within a division. When you start spreading out, sometimes it's just co-review. Uh, that could be a disadvantage or an advantage, depending on what's going on. The ideas do primarily come from the community, but at least the ones that I've been a part of uh, throughout the years and I've watched evolving, you know, we get a lot of ideas from the community, but we really try to take care about setting aside money from core programs associated with problems that just really aren't being addressed yet uh, in a core program already. So when Infuse started, one of my tasks, I, I was a data analyst back then, was to work across the foundation to see what we were already funding, potentially in this area where all three uh, systems were covered. It was not a lot. All right, and we were getting a lot of input from the community about the system, so there was a whole bunch of stuff that came together, really, that pointed us towards that initiative. It's just one example, though. Um, again, a lot of it is community-driven. Is there interest in something that no one's being able to address by one discipline alone for these larger programs? But within divisions, I think it's a lot easier to handle, even across a single directorate, so because of the way we operate, we're more familiar with each other. So, yeah, but I, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great question. And I think, you know, Infuse is a good example of the community really making a strong case from water sustainability climate of how important this topic was, that we have to add components to it. We had strong advocates across the foundation for that. You know, um, most of these cross-foundational initiatives 
tend to be five years, right? And so the, it's really driven by the budget. Um, senior leadership makes ultimately the decisions, but at, but but as a at the programmatic level, there's a lot of advocates, you know, saying this is important and here's why. And we look to, as I indicated. Um, reports from the community, you know, saying, you know, this, this really question needs to be addressed. I just um, want to highlight the raise mechanism because one of the cases we made for that, that was from the Inspire pilot, which many of you might know about. Well, the working group, we made a case saying, look, there's, there's, t we, we need a place for these really out of the box ideas that don't co-review well, right? One panel loves it, the other doesn't, but, but there's there's something really neat here. And so that really came from that um, saying, look at all these examples that we have. And a lot of the things that we fund through that had actually gone through panel review where the program director plucked it out and said, no, we must do this. So we, we have quite a toolbox and we're pretty creative, I would say, across the foundation at trying to support the best ideas with the limited funds that we, we do have. But Brandy's right, we have to protect the core and then at the same time, we have to make room for these cross-foundational initiatives. So there, it's not a simple answer to your, to your question. Uh, and you, you had an additional component that she just touched on about the review process for such of these. So when we have these larger initiatives, we also have, an, you know, we have requirements in the solicitations, mm -hmm. but we also give a lot of extra instruction to our reviewers as well, right? Because they're also going through these growing pains of like trying to look at these large interdisciplinary or convergent topics. It's not easy walking in, being a disciplinary expert in one piece and looking at something that you're not really an expert in and, and having to evaluate that. And so what is your value as a reviewer and what can you contribute? It's, it's the same on the reviewer end as well. Yeah. Oh, I mean, do others have comments? Oh yeah, Kendra. Well, I was just gonna say one more thing about um, co-review that the question touched on who I can't see who asked that, but um, we have done a lot of study on we were like, are we hurting proposals by sending them for uh, co-review and getting at this idea? Certainly as a PI, I thought co-review is the kiss of death. You know, that's twice as many people to hate my proposal. And, you know, this is just, it's, it's, it's going to hurt a proposal to co-review it. Um, we've actually published a paper on this. So this is public information that at least um, in DEB programs that when we do choose to send a proposal for co-review, it has a slight, I don't believe it's statistically significant, uh, higher chance of getting funded um, than, than not. So if the content is there and the other program agrees that the content is there, um, there's something like a little bit more interesting about those proposals in general or, or the buy-in from the second program um, is somehow helping. Um, so just to kind of demystify that process because it's not a PI driven decision, right? And so a lot of, you know, PIs never knew that their proposal was being co-reviewed and they say things like, I would have written it differently if I knew it was going for co-review. Um, but just to, to let you know that the data don't support that idea, at least in our division. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just concur with that. We also had concerns about from PIs about the double jeopardy issue, and uh, the data did not seem to suggest that. In fact, uh, some of our uh, sister programs, for example, OCE, they typically run panels, whereas in AGS, it's uh, unsolicited. Uh, we're in the traditional mode to which everybody is now trying to emulate. In the beginning, it was like, why is AGS the only one that's the outlier? But now with the proposal pressure because of the deadlines, you know, people are t attending to move away. And so we would have our uh, program uh, manager uh, colleagues in OCE say, well, this one, if it was out of sync, you know, with the panel review, they would say, well, we'll just go by the merit, uh, the ad hoc review. So I think uh, it's the, uh, it's when the program directors are sensitive to those kind of issues, then they bend over backwards to ameliorate it. And so our data did not support that uh, uh, projects that were co-reviewed uh, fared had less success rate. Yeah. 
did others have comments on that before I move just, on? Just very briefly. That's a, the same is true for ocean sciences. I think just the flip side of some of these concerns is that um, co-review, um, co-funding is leveraging and people love leveraging. And there are a lot of other um, uh, places in the foundation um, co-funding opportunities through EPSCoR or through international. And um, these help to often raise proposals that might not be at the top level uh, to things that are actually fundable that the program can invest in because it becomes easier. Um, okay. No, if I was going to follow up, I want to sort of summarize the statement here that I think I'm hearing, which is the, a common um, thing I've heard is this stovepiping thing that you know you mm -hmm. you haven't you we work in an earth not in a div division and we try to put a proposal that has some maybe some biology and some hydrology and something else and there's a sense that um th either isn't a niche or when it gets in there it gets you know poorly reviewed and you're you i hear you collectively saying you don't think that's actually the case the da data don't bear that out okay. in any of our divisions okay yes I just wanted to make sure that you knew that the same experience is through in EAR. We did the same analysis and it doesn't show okay. negative impact. Okay. The flip side of that is that many of these special programs are enormously oversubscribed. Yeah. And the success yeah. rates in some of those, because you're taking what would have been dispersed among many different uh -huh. programs, and you're saying, we're going to only spend this much money on it across the foundation. And so actually, the, the, the investment it potentially is, is smaller when you focus in, in on a single. Okay. Um, so it's just, some, it's just the flip side of this argument that we need a special program for special ideas. Okay. Um, thank you. If there are burning questions on the same topic, we can go for it. Um, at, but I have, I have comments from Don and Leho and Shimon that have been waiting for a while. So if you feel altered, okay, let's go with let's go with Don. Yeah, I wanted to. These are question maybe more for Brandy and Jessica and Kendra. But if you could follow up a little bit on the international collaborations and talk about what you think has really worked well and and what some of the big challenges are. You go first, sir. So, so um, some of the big challenges that we're seeing more and more is open access of data, right? Not, not all countries have the same philosophy or practices. And I think that yesterday's panel and the work that EarthCube is doing is really, um, I, I would urge the community to, you know, you're on the forefront of some of these issues and to, to explore how, how we break down barriers internationally, right? Um, we spend a lot of time on our international agreements on that on that aspect. Um, certainly when we work with a country, when we have similar merit review, right? And so that's, you know, that's pretty much straightforward. So there's a reason we do a lot with the UK. I, I, um, Nick, yeah, yeah, but, but in terms of, Nick, but, 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 you know, the UK, the UKRI has now reorganized, right, to make, to hopefully facilitate. But, but with that said, though, we share similarities in terms of how we review. We have lead agency agreements, which uh, Brandy can certainly talk to. And so what that allows us to do, talk about double jeopardy, is that um, we've heard from the, um, international community is that, you know, having both proposals submitted twice, you know, so maybe we'll fund it on our side, but the, uh, the international partner won't, and that becomes complicated. So with the lead agency model, what we do is um, we decide with our counterparts, okay, this particular proposal, is, will it go through the NSF review process, or in the case of the UK, the UK process. With Israel, they've actually deferred to our uh, merit review system, and so they said, if this proposal goes through um, merit review and is selected, we will fund the Israeli side. And so, so those work quite well, but you can't do that with every country. One, we need interest from the community. You know, we get countries all the time who want to have a lead agency agreement with NSF. And then when we do our analytics and we see, well, we only have about 15, 20 active proposals with that particular country. So, you know, so, that, so, so that's one thing, you know, I would say is the merit review and then the, and then the data, the data access. Yeah, so the data access is also 
one of the things that can be enhanced with them too, depending on what you're doing as well. And the other thing that I'd really like to put a shout out to, because this came up uh, pretty heavily in the recent SIT solicitation, is associated with uh, infrastructure and the sharing of infrastructure in different um, different sites in different countries and allowing access across those for research that just would not have happened uh, if we didn't have this international collaboration. and. One thing that she she didn't mention as well, so when we are setting up these international collaborations, yes, there needs to be interest, but at the same time, it's somewhat of a bandwidth issue. Um, I am unique in, in my division for this. I've been around for a while, so I know how to do this, but it's literally me tracking everybody's program at the same time for multiple countries. Um, the SIT solicitation was specific. They all came to me, so I didn't have to chase anyone down. Uh, so there are some downsides to some of this international activity, and it's, it's not a lack of your office or my office other than a lack of manpower. I mean, we just we don't have the staff to cover this, and they are intricate, uh, particularly when you had shared review processes, you really have to be on top of stuff. Um, the Chinese one, that's actually a lot less impactful on my time because they do their review process and I do mine, and then we come together, and, and we decide uh, were there ones that came to the top in both. It's, it's much easier to handle, but at the same time, it's a lot less, I would almost say, the diplomacy in that case because we aren't working together as strongly. Um, and all these are different. They all have different sets of rules. But all the ones we have have been extremely beneficial and they are worth the effort. The key is do you have the people that could actually help run them? And I, I think that might actually be some of our biggest limitation in some of these. Yeah. Kendra, did you have a comment? Yeah, Kendra. People are waving at the screen. Well, yeah, I was just going to add that, um, just to amplify that, like, it is worth it for some programs, right? So it's not an accident that Dimensions of Biodiversity in DEB was the program that we went after an international partnership with Brazil, which contains most of the world's biodiversity, and China, and South Africa. So, you know, we, we really chose those partner countries um, and added them kind of sequentially as their scientists and their funding agencies kind of got to a level where we could work together and trust um, the process. But um, we do have a lead agency agreement on dimensions of biodiversity. I just wanted to kind of remind us that, you know, think about which nations, which programs, you know, where is it important to invest this precious time that, um, that Brandy uh, and Jessica were talking about. Yeah, and I, I would just like to echo um, Dimensions of Biodiversity is an example, really, of a thoughtful international collaboration. We often look to that one in terms of models for moving forward, how we do this. We've been doing this for quite a lot of time, so we always are looking what's, wor you know, I think your question, Don, is a good one. What's worked well and why? And then will this work in this country and why? Uh, we spend a lot of time with, our, uh, with, the, with the lawyers at NSF going through these agreements. We'd like to, as much as possible, streamline that process, get language that fits, you know, that these are NSS values. This is what we do, you know, and then we, we transfer those across. But, but, I, but I do think that the mentions of biodiversity, how it was approached, it was very thoughtful. It added countries slowly. It looked around the world and, and, and looked at how those countries ran their programs as well. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, since we are on the topic of international, I would like to also in, uh, let the uh, committee know that out of the geosciences front office, we have an international program as well. We have an international program manager. Her name is Maria Yule, and she uh, works with other uh, funding agencies in the in the so-called Belmont Forum. And so every year they meet and they come up with a topic that is high priority based on what's happening in the various countries and then once they decide on that topic, uh, the countries that would like to put in monies towards uh, a solicitation do so. So it's at your own, uh, you know, it's a, uh, what should I say, a voluntary militia. And then uh, they will run the solicitation and so there are these projects that are being run out of Belmont Forum as well. In addition to the UK NERC uh, partnership we have or the BSF, NSF partnership recently, AGS became a member 
member of that one. So in addition to all that that's been run up, out, you know, in coordination with international, we do have this Belmont Forum as well. So I'm not sure whether there are uh, Earth's, uh, projects of uh, Earth Sciences interest in that. There are actually. There have been. There have been, yeah. There have been certainly in atmospheric and geospace. Thanks. Um, Leho had a question. Yeah, thank you all. This is um, incredibly enlightening. Um, this question is primarily, I guess, for uh, Brandy, Jessica, um, and Kendra. So, with respect to um, with respect to these sort of large scale programs, you know, it goes back a little bit to um, Bill's comments and questions. And you know, I, I've heard it mentioned as well that you know, five years is is kind of the you know um, is is the typical duration, primarily driven by budget cycles. Um, and having sort of seen water sustainability and climate infuse and, and sort of some of the comments we got from the community, the, the sense is that, you know, um, oftentimes with infuse, for instance, I think that there were maybe three or four solicitations over that five year period. Um, and years, things are sort of just beginning to sort of get ripe and, and people are, are psyched about the topic and then it, it sort of moves on to something else. And so, um, could you all address um, whether there, wh whether that's something that you potentially hear from PIs in in other um, in, in other directorates, um, and and what are the mechanisms or what are some potential mechanisms that might allow for something to have a longer a longer duration without sort of having to, you know, spin something into sort of something new. You know, we hear about. Well, infuse is the new C's and sus is the new infuse, but that's often not the, the best mental model. I mean, are there mechanisms for creating these, you know, longer term partnerships that get turned into something that is, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years in duration? So I, I'll address a little bit of it from the aspect of Infuse. I'm actually the keeper of the Infuse uh, portfolio at NSF, and that doesn't just include things that are tagged as Infuse. Um, any of you that have worked in data analytics across NSF know that if someone asks you a question on what research are you doing in this, that's a loaded question because you have to search the entire foundation because it can show up anywhere. Um, I don't have official numbers for this, but just to let you know, every year that we've had Infuse, we have roughly, I think, 75 million that we can tag to it. On top of that, there's close to an extra 100 million that is showing up in some of the core programs. The reason is the community starts to shift and look at these ideas, which is the whole purpose of these uh, initiatives, right? We want to make them mainstream. So even though our programs end, they aren't actually ending. Now, I know you're worried about like this continuity of these groups. Obviously, these projects are longer, longer term. Uh, I don't think anything at NSF is permanent except potentially long-term ecological projects, although I, I could be mistaken in that. Um, we do have some mechanisms. Uh, typically, they, the ones that I've been involved in have been on building networks. So NVs, of course, this last round of solicitation, we had um, the RCN addition to them, right? Because we want the community to take over on this and take it in new directions. And of course, those are going to go out five years beyond the end of the, uh, the initiative. Um, other mechanisms are a little bit less clear. Uh, so for instance, if I wanted to do a continuation on a project that I'm managing in my core program, which by the way, I don't have one, so I don't get this option. I actually can do that with the approval of my division director if I want to put money on it. But again, I just told you a major limitation to that. I have to have a core program budget. Uh, the same goes for things like supplements to add on to them. Often you have to pull money from other areas if you can. Uh, there are options. They're limited. Uh, but again, we do like our new initiatives to absorb some of the tenets of the old because we know that there's pieces that aren't done. So um, one program that has sustained is CNH, right? So I think that's that's something to look at, and that's the community now. 
right? And that's an established program. That started from one of these five-year initiatives, and it has continued. Um, I think Brandy's point is well taken in that the community does start going to the core programs. You know, I'd sit on the, um, the RAISE working group, and we would evaluate all these proposals that come in. So data shows that of every 10 inquiries that come in, say, there's no place at NSF for us. We need to submit a raise. Only one is actually submitted. I have been amazed at how many co-funding ways you can do things at NSF. And so a lot of times we'd get these proposals, we'd go back to the program directors, and they'd say, actually, they can submit to my program and co-review here. So, so I, I think there's sometimes um, maybe the community doesn't realize how much you can do through the core programs. And so I, I appreciate your point and what you're saying, and we hear that a lot, and it does concern us because you're building a community and then you're sort of taking away their funding, we try as much as possible to keep the ones going that really have uh, long-term, you know, um, needs, and then as much as possible, we start moving it to the um, core programs. And they have evolved, and they have, they're, they're different because of these, these uh, cost foundational activities. I think that's a really useful um, perspective, I think, that um, that is maybe something for the, the committee to take stock of that these these are sort of drivers of innovation in the core programs rather than sort of the other rather than the core programs themselves being sort of static. Yeah, we review core programs every year. They're constantly evolving. So, yeah. And there is a, a hybrid model. The, one of the reasons I said at the beginning that the P2C2 program and the GeoPrisons program sit in the core program is that it is the core programs who are making these decisions. And the core programs who are generating the ideas, I'm looking over at Jen Wade here because she's um, our primary representative partner in, in EAR for the, the GeoPrisons program. And um, so, the, it, it is embedded in the core programs, and the core programs are in the position to decide when it is when the ideas are mainstreamed. There was another program in ocean sciences that was an interdisciplinary program called um, the Ridge Program or R2K, and that one reached a point uh, about 10 years ago now where the, we decided, based on where the community was, that they were ready to be mainstreamed and come into the core programs. And that, that community continues to submit proposals and, and do good interdisciplinary science. So um, that's, that is another model. I'd like to add on one more point to this discussion, which is that, uh, you know, whenever we have the initiatives, there will be a working group that will uh, set the criteria, set the ground rules for working, and the cultures are so different across the different uh, directorates, and they come to some understanding. And sometimes there may even be proposals that were at the borderline, at uh, the cutoff thing, that the core programs then have stepped up and said, well, I see that one. And maybe uh, when you said hybrid model, I thought you were going to we were talking about that. So there will be some funding from, they'll cobble together a coalition of funding and then set that project at perhaps a reduced level or whatever. So I've seen that happen as well. And so that's how innovation is uh, sort of changes. So I like to think of it as like a random walk, like, you know, so you're really moving the science and engineering in small steps. And so the core programs are not at where they were. They've also changed. We can see that if we do the data analytics. Okay. Um, we've got we've got Shimon. My turn. Um, well, first of all, it's good to hear from all three divisions about the positive aspect of co uh, co review and co funding. And I think uh, um, the PI somehow, I mean, some PIs had the perception that co funding, co program, co review is. Um, challenging and disadvantageous for them. And so maybe um, NSF has some outreach to do to demystify or uh, clear out the misconceptions. Um, that's it. I do have a specific question for Anjali. Um, I wonder what your thoughts about uh, potential opportunities for uh, partnership between AGS and uh, uh, EAR. Um, you did mention the um, Hydro meteorology and hydro uh, climate uh, already have some, um, I think, collaborations, and that's probably through more um, co-review and co-fund, maybe NCAR. Um, and again, I 
feel like maybe any thoughts on formal partnership in the future on topics and between the divisions or between programs within the div two divisions? Yeah, some of the issues uh, on uh, meso scale and uh, smaller scales and sort of spatial uh, temporal time scales, of, which are of interest to both hydrolog hydrological sciences and, let's say, dynamic neutrology, carbon exchange, evapotranspiration issues. So uh, there is a lot going on, and it, it's actually uh, what are the barriers was one of the questions, and the barriers are actually relationship building. I think we uh, when Tom Torgerson was there, he was going out of his way, and we were working a lot uh, for formal. Uh, so coming back to your question of how do these things get formalized, uh, there needs to be a buy-in from both the divisions that uh, the work that is going to be proposed under the new rubric is beyond what's already happening. Otherwise, you know, there's a bandwidth issue, like the program directors are working on, uh, they are assigned their core program, but they also take on additional duties and willingly, uh, because it's uh, we're actually serving the community, most of the program directors uh, look at their job as a service to the community and the science that they represent. So it's a question of uh, finding a niche where um, it would benefit. And I thought that some of the work that was being done at NCAR through the community earth system modeling might have uh, taken us a little further than uh, it did. Uh, we actually funded an uh, INSPIRE proposal, Tom Torgerson and I, on this matter. And so the Kuwa CPIs were going to be working and taking the hydrological modeling, the insights they had gained, and then take it uh, and embed it in the model. Perhaps uh, it's not as easy. It, it, there are some challenges on that front because of the multi-scale interactions and all that that need to be sorted out. But, uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's an area that I think that is at least slow moving, if not in terms of uh, imposing an initiative per se, um, we should have a healthier uh, interaction, I think, in, uh, because it's already been identified at the core and maybe it could do with some kind of, I'm not sure how to engage the, those PIs who are involved in these issues with uh, community earth system modeling or even uh, field campaigns, if there were some joint field campaigns. We have uh, a lot of field campaigns with OCE on this matter, uh, you know, on the matter of clim uh, climate. But I haven't seen that much, like let's say the monsoons, the North American monsoons, there are some PIs that we've co-funded, career PI in fact, I think. Um, but uh, there may be some opportunities there that we could uh, actually uh, push the science forward as well as push our communities to meet. So I'm not sure whether a workshop is the way to do it or what might be the way to engage. Uh, I'm... Uh, a, a, I'm a little loath to be too prescriptive and uh, top down because I think, I firmly believe actually, I don't think, but I firmly believe that there's more intelligence outside the battery than there is within. So don't quote me, please. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that the good ideas and everything has to come from outside and we have to facilitate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A mm -hmm. uh, quick response, and then we have less than 15 minutes, and I've got four people with questions lined up. Get more? <laughs> well, the point is to hear from the panel, so if there is something you'd like to say. <laughs> I would just say it's, it's a, it's a science-driven thing. So, for example, if the science questions demands interactions, that's, that's when it happens. So, for example, you, you triggered me with the monsoon issue, right? Well, there's continental drilling, lake drilling that feeds into monsoon ocean drilling, right? So there's a natural car collaboration between EAR and OCE. So when you define it based on science and an earth system approach, that's when you're going to sort of drive that interaction. Um, so uh, next we have uh, Doug, if your question has not already been asked. I think most of mine was, was, was answered actually through Leo's question. Okay. The, I guess the only question I had, and this is in the direction of collaborations driving to major new initiatives, is speed and timeliness of actually doing that. How, how can you do that in, in a, at a speed that is responsive to the urgency of the question?
That's that's budget uh, dependent in some cases. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but 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 that you hit on a really good point. I think we're pretty uh, expedient, like and practical. So if there's something out there that we think, wow, this needs to get funded, we'll do it. Now, if you're talking about a bigger program, that takes time and resources. So it it just it depends on the scale of what we're talking about. And I guess that's where I was going is. Is where do you take sort of a fledgling, fledgling idea or project, and, and what is the momentum required for that to become a major program of record and displace something else? Um, a lot, a lot of work at the program level. I think, I think Terry's point, science drives it, and so we will make the case, and we will start working across the directorates to do that, and we'll bump it up the food chain and say, here, here, this is what we need to do, and look at this report, and look at that report, and so there's, there's a lot of, of, of work and planning that gets that, and I would say that most of us who've worked on these big initiatives know that it has a shelf life, and so you do start thinking one to two years out. Well, what, what next, and what do we do and you know will it go away or can we keep keep trying but but budget realities and the budget process as you know is not you know our fiscal year starts October 1st it's rare that we know what our budget is until the spring I mean we that's that's the reality of what we work in for these big big initiatives we start planning years a, a couple of years in advance right because we have to submit the budget and the requests so Sometimes, if we can do it through co-funding, we will do it, yeah. And you make another good point, it was sort of buried in there, but sometimes without new money, mm -hmm. something has to go. Right. And that's, people don't want to give up what, what they have. So that's, that's a real challenge in trying to make room for some of these new things in the absence of new money, which, you know, we're flat as the new doubling. That's what we see. So um, we're we're lucky lucky to have flat budgets. Okay. Um, Bill had a question, but his card is down now. Okay. Um, Andrea. Then Carolina. Thanks. I just wanted to revisit a comment that uh, Candace made earlier when you were talking about some of the joint funded programs with EAR, like GeoPrisons and P2C2 that are kind of scheduled to come to the end of their term soon. So what piqued my interest was that you said those programs would be assessed, and I wanted to maybe press you a bit on the specifics of how does that assessment process work when you're deciding whether to sunset, continue, or modify a program and anticipating perhaps part of your response. If part of that is community input, can you be specific on, you know, how are you getting that community input for that? So that's a work in progress, but I can tell you what happened the last time, and it was actually before I was at NSF, but there was a blue ribbon panel assessed at the end of ESH, which was Earth System History. That was the, the precursor to P2C2, and there was an evaluation of the science out puts the, the, in particular, the, the synergy of uh, across the, the stove pipes um, and whether uh, an evaluation of, of the value added of having a single review process versus something that was distributed uh, around uh, NSF. Um, so that, that was one example and we expect that there will be something similar uh, coming up in the next year or so that will bring community members together. It will be very important to have that input. And um, it will also be very important to, uh, well, really essential to look at the themes of P2C2, which I had on a slide, but it wasn't really important. Anybody can look at the solicitation and say, well, this was 12 years ago when we came up with this. It's a little long in the tooth now. And if we're going to proceed with another um, incarnation of this program, we'd, we'd like to make sure it's addressing the pro problems and issues that, that are current. Um, Carolina? Uh, so thinking about your, you know, the budgetary issues, uh, the need for infrastructure, permanent perhaps infrastructure, it seems like international ways of collaboration are really important for things that should be observatories, right? Um, and thinking of that, are there efforts to try to partner with sort of, you know, bigger scale things like the European Research Council, right, which offers huge grants to both PIs and Synergetic? And I'm not aware that there are NSF collaborations or if they're in the works, but that seems like the grander scale uh, sort of partnerships might be useful thinking in the future. 
Yeah, that's an excellent point. So as I mentioned, I spent um, nine months in the mathematical physical sciences working on their large facilities. This was a, something I was interested in. I had managed our Chile portfolio where we have um, the largest investments that NSF has is in Chile with the observatories, uh, the astronomy observatories. I would say and I would urge um, the community and EAR to really learn from MPS and what they've done. They've been very, um, you know, those observatories are um, ex uh, very, very large investments and how they have done that. Um, I think there's a lot of lessons that, that can be learned from, from EAR and how to do that. Um, I'll let my colleagues in EAR speak a little bit about the facilities and some of the interactions. I know there have been, we have worked on, on, on some of them, but nothing to the scale of what, what MPS has done with the observatories. I would just add to uh, an example of uh, ocean drilling, mm -hmm. you know, a decades-long program, international flight over. We, we exist, NSF has the, you know, one vessel at JR. There are other vessels that are, that are joined in with European and join us, other countries join us. They are consortia. Mm -hmm. So another wonderful model of how uh, mm -hmm. we come together to solve a science problem. It's an earth system problem, but not just drilling in U.S. waters uh, for ocean discovery. We're look, trying to solve the global problems, and so and a long history of success there. Mm -hmm. Any plans for the ERC, for the European Institute? For? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we've been interacting quite a bit with the EU and the ERC, and there's, um, uh, you know, with their uh, Horizon 2020 and looking forward, um, that has that has not been a, a, a linear conversation because there's different differences in terms of how we approach that. That has, yes, I, I can say yes, but it, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it has taken a lot of conversation in terms of how do we implement this and, and it, it, it's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. okay. Lena, I finally got the signal that she has been waving at me. Thank you, Kate. Um, so two, two examples. Um, isn't the ERC who co-funds um, the careers and postdoc fellows to spend time with uh, the ERC? So the ERC actually invites career awardees and postdoctoral fellows, the EAR has a postdoctoral fellowship program, to spend time in, in their uh, research programs. They pay dispensers in Europe. We, we just have to get them there. So I think that's a, a good start. And we have had conversations with uh, people from ERC in how they select their topics for some of their larger programs and when is the right time for NSF to partner. So that's an ongoing conversation. Thank you. Uh, question from Bill. This is actually picking up on something Carolina said. I, I realize this flat funding, as you said, that's the new double. Um, uh, and, in, when, when one starts thinking ambitiously about programs, we also know of this mid-range instrumentation program. Is it fair to think of that as external to your core? And so that's actually if we can design ideas that could compete in that, that's a plus. Is that the right way to think about that? I was actually thinking of, yeah, you know, we talked about it leveraging with international, we talked about various divisions, et cetera, and directorates, and we didn't talk about Office of Integrative Activities, yeah. uh, where the science and technology centers uh, reside, and so when one of our uh, PIs submits a winning science and tech proposal, it's a huge boost for the field because um, it's like coming from OIA and the scientific oversight is by perhaps uh, co-managed with the person at OIA. And similarly for the mid-scale infrastructure that's currently taking place. So the successful projects are being worked out and they'll be announced, I guess, uh, by the end of summer or whatever. So that's a huge boost. That's coming from OIA. So that's leveraging OIA funds. And so we always encourage our PIs to go for some of that uh, money as appropriate. Is it, it just a, a similar parallel? Is it is it right to characterize these sort of uh, programs that lie separately from the core program as commonly having the characteristic of being um, bigger in terms of cost projects? Is that it? Was that not the case? Is it? Is that not necessarily? Yes, there is this perception that everything that's done uh, needs to be done cross directorate cost division needs to be big. Yeah. And I've been one of the few people who, who says that when you're starting something, it doesn't necessarily need to be big, you know. And you could do high risk, high impact, and it could be modest in size. Yeah, it just depends on the topic and what it is. And have you have we identified the bottle? 
bottleneck uh, that is, uh, it could be in one of the disciplines, it could be interdisciplinary, but the main thing could be here. So identifying that and picking the diamond from all those interdisciplinary proposals, that's the challenge. But I do not necessarily think, but there, yes, they tend to be larger. They tend to be larger. And okay, can as I we are. Go ahead, Ken. Um, so a lot of the um, a lot of the new uh, cross cutting initiatives have kind of two tracks. I don't know if you've seen these in a lot of solicitations, but um, like Candace was saying, you know, sometimes the community has to be ready. You know, sometimes it can get ready. Sometimes you want to help the community get ready for some of these um, larger, more imaginative types of projects. And so um, I think the model is becoming having kind of a planning grant track or you know, some kind of um, smaller award size that gets the group together, maybe does some of the initial thinking necessary to um, coalesce around, you know, a winning project or a winning idea, a winning topic. Um, so I've seen I, that two-track model is increasingly common, I think, for um, some of these um, harder science targets to reach. Okay. Thank you. And with our one minute left, um, <laughs> um, I would just want to know if there are any burning real quick, like a couple words, uh, responses to what can our committee do to lower barriers or any of the any of the perceived and or real barriers that you have faced in, in developing these collaborations. If there is a single word or something to ponder and we can discuss over lunch. I would just go back. Communication is so important. We, we things like this myth about co-review funding, which means we need to sort of say it every single year and every single in our various newsletters. Those are the kinds of things where we sort of just need to continuing the, the constant gardening problem. You can't say it too often. And those are the kind of things that are really helpful. I would say that uh, I look forward to the report in terms of uh, what the next, uh, what you as experts in the field uh, prioritize and then we would be seeing whether some of those priorities align with our own priorities and that would be an uh, initial place to begin moving forward. So I look forward to seeing your prioritized list rather than just uh, sort, of a, 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 sort of a laundry list or a shopping list, yeah. Okay. And I just want to say that I, there was, uh, I, I feel like we could have taken much more time than we we had. Um, certainly for the ocean sciences side, we had uh, a, lots of points that could have been made about each one of these questions. So I think I will speak for myself. I would be happy to follow up if the committee has any questions um, uh, on anything that we didn't touch on. Thank you so much. And so uh, with that, I really want to thank all the panelists and everyone for um, your questions. And this is really just incredibly illuminating for, for all of us, I think. And um, would like to invite you, I guess, to have a lunch with us and uh, turn it over Bill to say bye and thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I, I want to thank the panel too. It was very interesting and um, brought back memories of the time I spent in NSF and <laughs> even some good memories. And. <laughs> Uh, and, and we're going to reconvene promptly at 1.15, still an open session. And um, as, as was mentioned, you're welcome to join us for lunch. If you've got dietary restrictions, uh, Remy, where did he go? He used to be right there. Oh, he's behind me. Okay. He's got some meal tickets. You're, you're free to use those in the cafeteria and then come back and eat with us. And um, I think that's all I need to say, right? Oh, the cafeteria is on the third floor. Yeah, and if you, if you wish to buy your own lunch, the cafeteria is, is open, so you can do that as well. If you guys want to grab lunch and take it upstairs to the third floor so that you could get some light, you can do that too. <laughs> so thank you. We are adjourned until 1.15.
Panel, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, please use your microphones when you talk, when, when it's your turn to talk. And uh, Don Sparks, who's sitting right, ne right next to me, is going to be the moderator of the panel. And so I will turn it over to him, and he'll do some introductions and then start the discussion. Thank you, Jim. Um, <clears throat> as Jim said, I'm Don Sparks from the University of Delaware, and I'd like to welcome all of you um, to the panel this afternoon. And thank you very much for being here. Uh, this session deals on partnerships that EAR could form with other federal agencies. And you probably read the, the scope and the task of the committee. And one of those is a discussion of how EAR can leverage and complement the capabilities, the expertise, and the strategic plans of its partners, including federal agencies, domestic and international partners, to encourage greater collaboration. Uh, dealing with uh, research assets and data. So what I'll do is start off with um, a short introduction. Um, all of you have the booklet with the longer bio information. I'll just hit some of the highlights, uh, and then we'll get started with the discussion. So David Applegate um, is Associate Director for Natural Hazards at the U.S. Geological Survey. In that role, he leads USGS hazards planning and response activities and oversees the coastal and marine geology, earthquake hazards, global seismographic network, geomagnetism, landslide hazards, and volcano hazards programs. A lot of different programs. <laughs> uh, Gerald Bowden is um, a program scientist at NASA, headquartered here in Washington. He's the focus area lead on the water and energy cycle uh, program, which seeks to understand and characterize global hydrology and track how energy moves from the tropics to the higher latitudes. Mary Votek. Votek. Votek is the Senior Scientist for Astrobiology and the Science Mission Director at in a, a NASA Headquarters. Uh, she's Founding Director of the Nexus for Exoplanet System Science, which is a NASA research coordination network dedicated to the study of planetary habit, uh, habitability. Uh, Jim Rusted from DOE is unfortunately not here, uh, but we're also pleased to have Nancy Cavallaro, who is the National Program Leader at USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Nancy also co-chairs the Carbon Cycle Interagency Working Group under the auspices of the, of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. So we have about an hour and 45 minutes for the session. Um, if each of you could keep your, your remarks to about eight to 10 minutes, that would be great. That would leave us about 55 minutes uh, for the uh, committee to ask questions. And um, you have been given, I think, a number of guiding questions, which if you could address many or all of those, those would be great. Um, and then we'll follow up with committee questions. So David, uh, if you'd like to start, please. Great. All right, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to speak to you, and thank you all for your 
participation in this uh, committee. This is a very important undertaking. Uh, uh, NSF uh, or Science Division is is one of the most significant partners for uh, for the USGS writ large, and but particularly for the Natural Hazards Mission Area, which is my uh, my specific responsibility. Um, and I should say that you know we benefit greatly from the collaborations that are enabled with the academic community through our interactions with uh, EAR and with the investments that EAR makes, um, as well as uh, you know the the the, the really significant uh, fundamental uh, advances um, and sets of capabilities that uh, that NSF has has uh, supported. Um, at the same time, I think we are able to bring first access to the various capabilities that we have and, and the open data sharing for seismic networks and volcano observatory data and portable deployments. But in particular, I think it is that we can help with that, uh, uh, the, what is it, the broader benefit um, side of things and to help identify some of the big challenging problems where um, our mission space overlaps. So uh, anyway, just really appreciate the chance to, to, to be a part of this. Um, and I should, uh, so I've just got a, a few slides here to, to kind of identify a couple of the partnerships. I'll try to touch on um, some of the questions as we go, and then certainly in the discussion, hopefully we can, we can talk some more about those. Um, we do work very closely with the AR and a number of the other divisions um, across the, the National Science Foundation, uh, Oceans, Engineering, Social Behavior, behavioral sciences. Um, we have a semi-annual in terms of the sort of coordination, how do you do it? Uh, one of the ways is we have a semi-annual meeting um, with between our program coordinators and the, the program officers, both in EAR as well as in um, OCE. And that's I, it's been tremendously beneficial on our side. Um, we also have just a lot of interaction between our scientists um, and the uh, the academic community that is, of course, the, the heart of what what, uh, what NSF is about, and so the opportunity to participate and be part of some of these um, coordinated efforts, like uh, like the Southern California Earthquake Center or GeoPrisms, or um, of course EarthScope, um, and these incredible investments that that were made through that. So anyway, I, I just uh, I think there's a number of different ways that we we find both at an interagency level as well as at a scientist to scientist level to keep that coordination going. Uh, the USGS has uh, a number of different missions. Um, so in addition to our hazards, uh, we also have a, a fair amount of interaction between our water mission area in EAR. Um, core science systems is where we have our sort of fund foundational mapping capabilities, including geologic mapping as well as geospatial. Uh, land resources includes the uh, Landsat uh, satellite that we have jointly uh, uh, do with our good friends at NASA, um, energy and minerals uh, mission area, um, and then probably to a, to a lesser extent, but with some, some interactions, I think, with the AR in, in the realm of ecosystems and certainly with environmental health uh, as we look at what are the impacts from uh, both to, to, to wildlife as well as to, as to humans. So I think across these missions, we have a lot of ways that we, we touch on it. Um, but I don't think there's a single part of what we do in hazards that, that doesn't have interaction. We work on a lot of different hazards in USGS, so just as sort of a little context here, we've got the primary responsibility for, for monitoring and assessments for earthquakes, volcanoes, and landslides, but then uh, the, uh, the capabilities that we bring are, in many cases, we're the eyes and ears for NOAA and their responsibilities. So the same seismic networks that uh, both USGS and NSF have invested in feed directly into NOAA's tsunami warning centers. We maintain over 8,000 stream gauges. That's absolutely critical for NOAA's ability to do uh, uh, warnings uh, for severe weather. Same thing with coastal uh, coastal inundation, storm surge, um, our coastal and marine you know, geology programs. We're we're working on the geologic aspects of both the coast and the offshore, um, and uh, that then feeds into, for example, understanding barrier island impacts, where you're going to have evacuation issues, where you're going to have breaches and whatnot. Um, space weather is, I don't think, part of EAR's portfolio, but uh, we have a, a key component of that uh, with the ground-based observatories um, and significance there for both uh, geomagnetic storms when our sun turns unfriendly, um, as well as more recently that's been um, 
a quite a bit of uh, engagement on the issue of electromagnetic pulse. And one, one EAR-related interaction has been the support NSF has provided through Earthscope for the magnetotelluric surveys, and we actually have in our budget request to try to continue that and carry that forward as part of that uh, EMP effort. Um, and then we also are the, we have sort of the CDC for wildlife, uh, the National Wildlife Health Center, and of course then the geospatial data that underpins everything. So you heard I'm responsible for the Natural Hazards Mission Area. So these are the six programs. Um, you'll recognize in particular GSN is, is, uh, is a joint, essentially a joint program with, with funding from both uh, USGS and NSF. Um, and then with this sort of broader responsibility across all the hazard work the survey does. And in particular, working a lot these days in the sort of the space of risk. So we take the hazard information and we try to make that as real as possible, whether through scenarios or through other kinds of products that can, can make this meaningful. And in pretty much everything that we do, um, it is that foundation of observations and then the expertise developed by our scientists that is what enables us to then deliver these societally re relevant products, the long-term hazard assessments, and then that rapid situational awareness and sort of real-time capabilities, all of it enabled by communication. So I think one of the strongest uh, and most long-standing partnerships has been in the area of earthquakes, and we have a statutory uh, connection here. Uh, the, since 1977, the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program uh, with NSF, the USGS, the National Institute of Standards Technology, and FEMA, um, both EAR and engineering, and to a certain extent social behavioral, um, have all been part of that from the NSF side of things. And what NEHERP really does is it, I think this, I, I use the seismic hazard maps here as the example of what I see as the heart of NEHERP, which is taking those fundamental advances, whether in, in, in geoscience or in engineering, and having a mechanism to turn that into something that society can directly apply. And so the hazard map is essentially everything we know, everything we understand about earthquake hazards, whether it is research that's been done in, in, you know, in geodesy and paleo seismology, the seismic data, uh, geologic mapping, all of these different pieces are coming together into something that then is, feeds into seismic provisions and ultimately model building codes that then applied to a trillion dollars worth of new construction every year. So that's a great outlet for fundamental science um, being brought to bear in society. Uh, GSN is, is pretty much your poster child for good government. Right. This is one network capability that's implemented in partnership with uh, with Iris um, and UC San Diego. It's one network that supports NSF's fundamental science mission. It supports the USGS mission for uh, you know locating, characterizing earthquakes, and then being able to do assessments. It supports NOAA's mission for tsunami warning, and it's a, it's a secondary uh, network for uh, nuclear test ban uh, monitoring. So it is. It has been capitalized through DOE. It's funded both USGS and NSF. It's, again, NOAA is a key partner in this. It's. It fits in all of our mission space, and we are rather than everybody go off and build their own networks, we have one network that meets all of those different needs. And so it's, I think, a, a, a just just a great example of of where, why these partnerships make sense to each of our mission. And uh, then in the volcano arena, uh, just to highlight uh, the National Volcano Early Warning System. We just got uh, Congress congressional authorization for NVUs, and I think it, it's a it's a nice example of a, a framing mechanism for how do we prioritize and focus whether it is it is research or monitoring or assessment activities related to volcanoes. How do we prioritize that based on? the threat to society, both the, you know, proximal hazards in the case of, uh, of Kilauea, as it uh, demonstrated so magnificently this past year, um, as well as the threat to aviation. But then that, within that framework then are uh, essentially the, the you sort of guideposts for where sort of those foundational um, research and, and monitoring efforts, um, how those, again, link in to what is going to have the, the biggest impact for society. 
And then uh, thinking now, we, you know, we have a number of these really important longstanding partnerships, and I've mentioned a couple of those. I think one of the areas that is um, a real opportunity going forward is in the realm of subduction zone science. And I know this is something that there's also been a lot of interest from the academic community. We put together a plan from our standpoint to, to help sort of focus what our piece of this is, where, where our, our greatest needs and interests lie. Um, and then we've been involved in active dialogue with our NSF counterparts as they build the, uh, I'm going to forget the, the name, the research coordination networks and, and other mechanisms of bringing the community together. These are the biggest, baddest geologic hazards that face us on the planet. And we have so much left to understand both foundational understanding, um, but then to, to apply and, and use that. So I think this is an area, arena for a real opportunity, uh, both for EAR as well as for building partnerships with um, OCE, um, and then with a number of other agencies, including our good friends at, uh, at NASA. We all have something to contribute to this arena. So I will I'll, uh, end my just sort of opening comments with 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 that um, I think we have as I said lots of good examples where um, we're we have we have co-benefits um, from investments um, and again NSF is able to make investments we'll never be able to make from the standpoint of the survey but we do provide that sort of societal impact uh, avenue uh, that I think is um, is valuable so thank you again Thank you very much. Uh, Mary? Um, so um, I'll, I'll start off. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Both of them. Um, just by telling you a little bit about my program and where I sit in NASA, I'm the head of the astrobiology program, which is not alien autopsies, and it's not. Um, yeah, sorry. Nope. <laughs> Um, but is actually trying to understand the origin and evolution of life on Earth through the context of first how did we form and evolve a planet that could actually support life or that could provide the environments that could um, allow for all the reactions and the steps that were required for life to emerge and then be sustained here on the planet. And we use everything that we know, I mean we fundamentally in uh, our Earth science um, because we're trying to understand everything about the Earth, then to project it to other bodies in our own solar system. And now we've discovered the billions and billions of exoplanets, um, and many of those are going to be like Earth uh, in terms of being able to support life. We're now mapping it on to those planets as well. Um, it's a discipline that brings together chemistry, geology, geophysics. We have to understand how planets work. Um, and so as I look at, I just decided because the organization of NSF sometimes is confusing, um, I just looked up what was in EAR uh, because we work with people in ocean sciences, of course, and in polar science. But every single disciplinary program you have in there, we have some sort of connection with. Um, and we work most closely with program officers or our own PIs to let us know what kind of programs are going on at NSF um, and ways that we might be able to collaborate. So scientifically, we're interested in very similar sorts of questions. How does the Earth function? What was the Earth like during the, Archean, the Hedean and the Archean? Um, so many of the paleo programs that, that NSF has, we have um, PIs that we fund as well. Um, and then geobiology and low temperature geochemistry is really important to us. Um, some of the things, again, when I think about our relationship with NSF, intellectually, we answer similar questions. We're interested in uh, analog uh, research sites to understand the extremes of how things function um, on Earth, whether it's up in a mountain or down uh, miles below the surface. Uh, we're interested in how the, the Earth is plumbed because that's really important. And again, these planetary processes that support life are really important to us. Um, I would think, um, I would just like to throw out there as part of, um, of what we have experienced in trying to, to interact with NSF and any other agency is we all have slightly different perceived and real cultural differences. Um, some of us um, that are sitting before you have what people 
call or is known as uh, mission uh, agencies, where sometimes some of the research we do is a little bit more applied. In the case of of my work in, and in planetary sciences at NASA, it's not exactly that it's applied, but we have very specific questions that we want to have answered. So when we go for projects, we're looking for partners that want to answer those exact same questions or some aspect of it. I think um, that I mentioned that analog environments are important to us. Ongoing studies that have been supported by NSF in the long term are really important for us to get, um, you know, the sort of the history of the site and, and what we can learn as a site evolves. Um, I think there's a lot to be shared in terms of technology development. We are the agency that makes pretty cool things to send very cool places. And um, I have had experience in, at NSF with people who are interested in technology development programs and coming in with us. We have much larger budgets in that regard, I think, than NSF for technology development. And so um, that's a really important partnership for us because um, while we have the desire to make many of the measurements that you in this room are making here on Earth, we need to figure out the best way to do it someplace else. And so uh, we put a lot into developing those instruments and technologies, but we also need to test them here. <clears throat> so I mentioned that there's sort of these cultural perceived and real differences. I also think that organizationally, like I said, I, I hear rumors about NSF being reorganized. It still looks pretty familiar to me, but I thought I would check it anyway. We certainly reorganize ourselves in NASA. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we're facing, which I think NSF has as well and other agencies is as the science demands interdisciplinary research, how do you cross division, you know, how do you cross those organizational structures, those funding streams to actually get the science that you need done. And so we're looking into different ways to do that at our own agency and we often look to what NSF is doing both successfully and unsuccessfully. <laughs> um, we're all trying to, to, again, overcome those barriers. Um, I think you'll probably hear too that um, Congress pays attention to what we all fund. They're somehow really concerned that researchers might be double dipping and that we need to carve out our, our world very clearly. And I mean, I fund things that also NIH funds. And how can that possibly be? And so that's one of the challenges that we in government agencies that both do the science and fund it need to consider is the perception um, by those from outside that, you know, nuance and subtlety is not a strong point uh, on the uh, yeah, so <laughs> for the people who I ultimately work for, so I'll just uh, put it and say it that way. Um, let's see, I'm just going to see if there are other things I wanted to mention. Um, I think that, you know, what you'll, in all of the interactions that we've had, again, um, you would think since we are all one government that passing money around or funding things together would be easy. Um, I, I, I noticed there's a question, do we, do we care about whether we have ownership? Um, I think that, at least in my agency, there's a tremendous uh, emphasis put on collaboration and partnerships, and so owning it with someone else is something that's very positive for us, but the reality of getting that paid for and the funding to go where it needs to go um, is just a nightmare. I've been working on an interagency agreement with NSF that has gone on now for four months, and I'm trying to give them a million dollars. That should be easy. <laughs> um, and again, it all came from the same place to begin with. Uh, but these are things that uh, that there is, I think, all of us would agree, there's a will amongst agencies to make the right decisions about uh, maximizing and leveraging the funding that we get from the government and from the American taxpayer to get the best science to answer the questions we're all interested in. But there are these uh, organizational and bizarre rule impediments that make it sometimes very difficult. Um, so I will say so that for any of you that don't realize that you have, this is my pitch for Please come to my place for funding, potentially. Um, we at NASA, even though we study other worlds and, uh, and are, you know, tasked with doing space exploration, everything we know about everywhere else begins with what we learn about here on Earth. And so planetary sciences, as well as my own specific program, really rely heavily on the work that is funded and carried out by the scientists of EAR. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Nancy? Oh, okay. Um, 
How do I pull up the slides? And then, oh, okay. I have some slides. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've worked actually with NSF quite a bit um, over the years, and um, oh, you had it, and then it went away. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I've never, I haven't always paid attention to which division I was dealing with, so I could have these things confused. But I've tried to, I, I did look up, and we both have on our screens. <laughs> Division of Earth Sciences and Disciplinary Program section uh, to look at that, um, to figure it out. But anyway, to, to just to, to note who uh, NIFA is, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, um, we have what uh, this sort of new mission, we say invest in and advance agricultural research, education, and extension to solve societal challenges. But previously it was a little more um, uh, clear, I think, uh, to advance knowledge for agriculture, the environment, human health and well-being and community. So that brings back, brings in the humans a little more uh, explicitly in communities um, because we do, uh, it is, it is just extremely interdisciplinary. There aren't, aren't very many disciplines that aren't encompassed in this. And um, so our budget is a lot smaller than NSF's, but uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> and the focus is domestic, but there are a lot of opportunities for global engagement. Um, as long as there's some connection to somehow it'll help people here in the U.S. one way or another. And I'm really good at making that case <laughs> for whatever you say. Anyway, um, but uh, I'm uh, probably I only going to be there at NIFA through September. So that's my contact information, but James Dobrowolski will be um, sort of taking over um, most of my duties, at least for the short term, uh, after the, uh, we move to Kansas City. Um, so again, to what we mean by agriculture, et cetera, is um, it, it's, it's pretty much, you can think of it as food and everything, and fiber and everything connected to it. Um, uh, so we, it's not just croplands and animal production, but forests and rangelands and and all, uh, everything that intersects them and that is a, that affects them. So interactions with human health and other systems, urban systems, biodiversity, land use, land management, water, hydrology, all of that is is encompassed in it. And and uh, one of the the areas that I've been uh, emphasizing um, during my time at, uh, at, uh, at NIFA is uh, climate variability and change, climate adaptation, mitigation, resilience. And uh, so overall, the major goal is sustainability of whatever the system, the human system is. <laughs> and so I think there's a lot uh, going on at NSF uh, with that word. Sustainability is the big word, I guess, for now. Anyway, um, so the main program that we, uh, the biggest program that we have at NIFA that funds, we, we basically fund research. We don't do our own research, that's Agricultural Research Service, other agencies do that, uh, and we do uh, basically the same function that NSF does. Um, but uh, what, what we do have in our legislative authority for our biggest program is not just research, but research and education and extension. And I think that partnership with NIFA, with NSF, between NIFA and NSF, does sort of help bring out more of that, those broader impacts. And I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, uh, it also is a lot of flexibility in the program. We have no year funding, so it makes it a lot easier to deal with things. Okay, we have money in 2019, you have money in 2020, we can, we can make it work, you know, because we can wait because we have no year funding. Um, so, uh, and the other thing we do have is uh, most agencies, I think, have uh, uh, the ability to make grants for up to five years. We have up to 10 years need a major review after five years, but up to 10 years, the same grant. And so that might lend a little flexibility to uh, when you partner with us as well. Um, we used to have uh, 
a rapid type program. It went away this year. It may be coming back or it may not be, but that's, that's something that we have in the past collaborated on in the sense that, you know, okay, hurricane struck here. Uh, we'll fund this part because we only have a little bit of money and, and someone, other agency will fund the other part and we'll put it all together and have a really big project to see what were the impacts of the Hurricane Maria, for instance. Um, but there are a lot of other programs besides the AFRI, um, Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, that also have um, the potential for, for partnering and uh, for international work as well, because there was some talk about international. So I just brought out this, uh, um, we have a specific language in our RFA, our, our AFRI RFA about global engagement. And um, so when we say, okay, we're domestically focused, well, like I said, we can make the case. And so in partnering with an NSF, who doesn't necessarily have to have a domestic focus on all their research, um, we can still partner and do similar uh, things and co-fund uh, projects, and we have in the past done this. Um, and here are some other opportunities that aren't the AFRI program that, uh, that would uh, possibly, could possibly, we could establish partnerships with, and we may actually have some partnerships with some of these, um, but the ones I've, I've bolded, I think, are the ones that w might be of most interest to uh, EAR. Um, so anyway, I won't read those. Um, some current and recent interagency joint calls we've had um, with NSF, um, Plant biotic interactions has been ongoing for the last several years, um, perhaps not as much of interest to EAR. Uh, signals in the soil was already mentioned by, by Brandy. We've uh, been partnering on that, and I think there's a lot of interest in EAR in that. Cyber physical systems, uh, competitive grants program, robotics, I'm not sure how interested you'd be in uh, robotics. Um, innovations, you know, Infuse, uh, we've been involved in that from the beginning. And um, um, the Eagers, uh, we have some, some specific areas where we partner with NSF on. Um, uh, there are a couple more listed there, but some of the other programs that kind of led into Infuse, and at least in my way of thinking, that we partnered with NSF on uh, water sustainability and climate and uh, the ESOM program um, that was mentioned, I think, by, by uh, Anjali. Um, and then there's some other programs, interagency partnerships that we deal with. As, as uh, Don mentioned, I'm uh, co-chair of the Carbon Cycle Interagency Working Group, and we have a lot of uh, sort of things we do together uh, within the agency. NSF participates, but they haven't ever participated in a joint call, but we have had joint calls every three years on Carbon Cycle with uh, NASA, DOE, NOAA, and NSF sort of looks on from the side and, and sometimes helps um, to steer us this way or, or um, uh, sort of unofficially sort of collaborate across some of their programs that fund similar things. Um, there used to be more explicit uh, things on carbon cycle at, uh, in this program, in EAR. This was like in the aughts. <laughs> Um, other interagency working groups that uh, on modeling, integrative modeling um, that I participate in and uh, that NIFA participates in and uh, water cycle, water resources or other areas that uh, we, we like to partner in. <coughs> um, and uh, there are various other interagency groups, what I, I was thinking of, the, um, the IARPIC and the things around our Arctic issues. Um, and for, for us, we would be interested in land transitions, forest cover and forest tundra uh, transitions and permafrost are sort of the two main areas that we would uh, be able to partner with NSF on in this. Um, uh, I thought I'd say a little more about the AFRA program and potential connections to EAR. Um, I, that's not the way you say it. I don't know why the way I've been saying it in my head, so it came out, sorry. Um, <laughs> so we have, uh, I guess, two main areas in our RFA. Um, uh, under AFRI, there's three RFAs. One of them is called Foundational and Applied. Within that, there's one, an area that Congress has defined as bioenergy, natural resources, and environment, and we have defined these, pri these four priorities. They vary sometimes from year to year, but these are areas that I think um, also would be, uh, are ripe for um, partnering, and actually, if we partner with NSF, that's where the money's coming out of. 
what was assigned to that Benry program in one of those four areas, maybe all of those four areas. Um, and then there's also new uh, under AFRI, uh, something that's, there's some similar programs at NSF um, on cyber infrastructure and tools. And uh, within that, again, like the RCNs at, at NSF, we have, we sort of inverted the, the letters and we're calling co coordinated innovation networks. Um, so anyway, um, so those, those are uh, programs that um, where we can partner uh, some of the money allocated to AFRI for some of these areas we can take out and partner with NSF on and, and it's, it's actually quite advantageous in some cases. Um, I thought the, um, the Infuse, the uh, ESOM and, and Water Sustainability and Climate were particularly good um, win-win situations for both NIFA and NSF. Um, uh, another area that's fairly new last couple of years is we we have this program called Sustainable Agricultural Systems. Again, emphasis on sustainability, and I think there's a lot about that in in this uh, this division as well. Um, and those are the sort of three main areas. Um, they're written quite broadly, and you can read a lot into them. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's about sustaining uh, agricultural systems, but not just production systems, but um, but communities and um, and the interactions with the natural systems and and the managed systems. So um, some other ideas that I was you know, just thinking about how um, how how the partnership can be very helpful. You know, NSF has in all their proposals, I think in all of their proposals, they have this requirement for broader impacts, right? And and yet the, the agency kind of is all about research and often there's not as much emphasis as some people would like going into the broader impact side of things. And generally one doesn't want to put a lot of money in there if the emphasis is on the research. Whereas we do broader impacts all the time. We integrate research, education, and extension, and outreach, and, and all of that, um, you know, routinely with uh, most of our programs. And so that can be um, a, a way that partnering could, uh, through co-funding, and we do do co-funding oftentimes in these joint uh, calls, um, we could fund the education part, the outreach part, and and then uh, that could sort of uh, make make things a little easier um, on the budgets uh, on both sides and on our uh, requirement to have a certain amount of our funds go to these other functions. Um, uh, let's see, what else? What are I thinking? Um, oh, and then partnerships uh, I think have brought in the land grant colleges and a lot of the the programs there um, brought them more in tune with NSF because of these joint programs um, with with other agencies as well. With NASA, we've uh, uh, done joint programs and now a lot of our people are more interested in remote sensing as a result. Um, and so, uh, and, and vice versa, remote sensors are more interested in looking at agriculture and, and uh, so so that's um, that's something that I think is a, is a good thing. Um, international, uh, we have sort of uh, through NSF uh, partnered with uh, AI, IAI um, and with uh, Belmont Forum um, and uh, other areas that I think are of, of great interest. I think uh, land use and land cover change is a major uh, area that we have been focusing on and it's kind of dropped out of things and we could bring it back through partnership if you guys want to do it too. <laughs> um, so that was uh, that was mainly what I I think I kind of answered most of these questions or addressed them in some way or another. Um, you know, limitations and 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 gaps I think can be can be filled through uh, partnerships in, in a very nice way, and I've identified a few of those um, uh, problems. Um, I've found it works really well. Um, we figured out how to work together with with uh, NSF quite quite easily and know how to handle it. Um, NIFA is moving to Kansas City. Yeah. Much reduction in staff, much reduction in staff. So partnering on programs could be an easier way for us to get our money out the door. So just think about that too. <laughs> 
Anyway, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Gerald? Uh, good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, in front of the board. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have these slides with me. I just got back from two weeks in India and I did not have a chance to get everything approved. So uh, if I start falling asleep near the end, just blame it on the 48 hour flight to get back. Um, with that, and uh, fundamentally, NASA's Earth Science Division and EAR are very similar in how we approach things. What does EAR want to do? The ones basically kind of understand the fundamental science, the fundamental physics that drive a lot of processes. All the different missions that we launch into space and also our suborbital, our airborne missions, are all fundamentally trying to seek um, some sort of new parameter. Uh, is it um, something that's uh, what's driving earthquakes? Um, how fast are the uh, ice sheets uh, moving? How fast are they melting? How does water move its way through the energy cycle? Um, that's kind of the core of what drives NASA science. We end up collecting a lot of data. We've got cost cap missions, which means that we cannot analyze the data. You've got a science community that's rich with ideas, rich with capabilities, and kind of some of the experience that I have is basically from an NSF side, if, if it's remote sensing, then that's NASA's job to fund. And speed kind of seems sometimes a little bit of an artificial barrier in between, um, I'll just say the, some of the capabilities, because basically NASA's collecting a lot of data, and I think a lot of it goes unused. So throughout my talk, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of touch on some of these things and hopefully um, identify some opportunities coming up um, in the following years and um, potentially decades uh, moving forward. So how does NASA come up with an idea for a mission? It's actually a good uh, group of scientists say, we would like to better understand, I'll pick on David Apke, we just had the rich crest uh, earthquakes. How, how, what drives the earthquake process? And so we need some sort of technology. So what I'm going to describe is basically the NASA headquarters, uh, Earth Science Division, and within it, uh, we've got a number of different um, uh, for the subdivide. Within research and analysis, this is where we actually come up with the idea, the scientific just. So that's kind of, I think, the correct comparison with EAR is with uh, NASA's um, research and analysis. We come up with the ideas. The Earth Science and Technology Office, ESTO, is the one that develops the technology. They're the ones that are able to go ahead and come up with, how do we go ahead and address how we, I just learned full to death. And the, the search and the technology comes up with a viable uh, plan. The blueprints are handed over to flight, and they actually build the satellite. There's a lot more interactions and connections uh, within here, which gives kind of the fundamental things. So flight builds it. Once it's built and launched, it's up and collecting data. It now comes back to the research analysis side, and this is where we go ahead and one uh, fun, fundamental research. This is through our, our Rose's solicitations, mm -hmm. research opportunities in uh, our science. Um, but you know, basically, if you want um, Rose's solicitation, they come out around uh, Valentine's day every year. So roses on Valentine's Day, it's kind of the easy way of remembering. So research opportunities in earth and space science. Um, so that's when our solicitation comes out. And um, from it, we go ahead and then uh, uh, fund the, the peer research, but we also have applications. So the applied science program, how do we go ahead and make the data that we're collecting a little bit more societally relevant? And that's where that group comes in. And these are the groups, uh, the, the applied science program directly works with uh, USDA with the USGS with a lot of the agencies, especially NOAA, where basically there's an operational need for the data. We also work with the USGS for the science side. They've got scientists, but they also have an operational mandate. And what we do is basically try to collect data that could go ahead and help um, all agencies uh, be able to move forward, but also the academic community. And so that kind of gives kind of a broad overview of basically how the missions come together. It's, it's, we start with the science question, we work our way through until we actually have a mission, it's launched, and then we have the data that comes through. And it comes down to, depending on what the mission is, is how much money we have for being able to go ahead and take that data that we're collecting to the next level. One of the satellites um, that I'm responsible for is a funding mission called NISAR, NASA ISRO, which is India's um, NASA. That's why I was over in India the last couple of weeks. Um, synthetic aperture radar. This one mission basically is going to become NASA's flagship mission. The amount of data and products we're going to collect in the first year, 
you take everything that NASA has ever collected, we're talking about from Mercury to Pluto plus 40 years plus of Landsat um, on Earth, three times that volume in the first year. This is, I'll say, a headache on our side, basically how do we work with it, but it's opportunities for the NSF community. And so what I want to do is break down uh, this notion that basically remote sensing science is only funded by NASA. This is data that's being collected. NSF has got incredible in situ networks, as does USGS. Um, USDA has got soil moisture um, uh, networks that we all take advantage of. And this is where I see when NISAR launches in 2022, we're going to have more data than we know what to do with. On my, again, picking on NISAR for a moment, we've got a, a solid Earth piece to it. So uh, satellite radar is very capable. Uh, we basically do earthquakes, volcanoes, um, land subsidence, uh, surface water hydrology. We have an ecosystems component. We're, we're actually looking at global biomass. We're looking at disturbance uh, change. Uh, we have a cryosphere piece where we're tracking all the um, ice sheets as well as the global uh, glaciers. We're also looking at sea ice. Uh, if you go to uh, nysar.jpl.nasa.gov uh, or just Google NASA uh, uh, NISAR, uh, we've got over 20 white papers on the societal benefits that we go ahead and do with uh, NISAR. So if you're into forestry, We've got a lot of different capabilities there. This is where we are leaning on our fellow agencies and also in the academic research is basically, how do we go ahead and take this the next step further? This data volume that we're dealing with with, with NISAR, um, the Alaska Satellite Facility is going to be where the data was officially supposed to be held. but. We found out the volume of data, if we download it, process it JPL, and we try to get up to Alaska, the pipeline between Alaska and Southern California is not big enough. So if we started transferring data, we would never catch up. And so we're actually going to be using the cloud. And with the cloud, you've got specific charges to get data in and out. And we're dealing with huge, complex data sets. So we're working on developing tools in the cloud in which researchers can go ahead and come into the cloud. So it doesn't matter if it's an, uh, a NASA researcher, uh, an academic researcher, anybody with a Google account could go ahead and come in. So I see this as an opportunity of basically having additional partnerships. How can you go ahead and fund somebody that's interested in working with some of the NISAR data or any other uh, NASA data sets that will ultimately be moved uh, into the cloud for being able to go ahead and allow uh, processing time. We, um, and the other thing we're looking at basically by having tools in the cloud, um, uh, both ones that basically NASA has developed, but we're also going to have it so that um, other researchers, if they um, have um, codes, algorithms, they want to go ahead and put it into the cloud that can basically be shared by the broader community, it will enable them to go ahead and bring their tools into the cloud and work with the data. And if we actually find products that a lot of people really like, this is something we'll, we'll start considering, well, is this something that we'd like to actually start doing on a global basis? And again, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is trying to get the data, all the photons the NISAR um, uh, collects, we want to be able to get those out to the, uh, the broadest community, both from the research perspective and also as my uh, colleagues here uh, within the panel and those who could not be on the panel. So we've got a lot of opportunities coming up. If I dive a little bit deeper um, with um, how NASA's interacted with um, uh, EAR, uh, one of the many hats that I wear is I'm a program scientist within the Earth Service Interior Focus Area. And uh, with this, we do a lot of work with UNAFCO, so an NSF-funded uh, um, group within um, GAGE. And um, we actually pay UNAFCO on the order of about $1.1 million a year. Uh, the uh, UNAFCO operates, um, uh, basically maintains our network of GNSS um, sites. We also help support WINSAR, which is the um, academic access to um, radar data that's not uh, managed by NASA. It also enables a lot of other out, uh, education outreach, um, all through NAVCO. And the partnership that we've had with NAVCO has been wonderful. We've, um, it, it's been mutually beneficiary, both by us providing um, extra resources to help uh, NAVCO move along. But we now, uh, but we have um, a solid group of people that maintain our GNSS network. And so I, I see that as, as uh, I'll say, in, at least from my perspective, case study of uh, what has worked really well uh, collaborating with uh, NSF in this area. Um, we have, let's see, um, 
Okay, some areas that are coming up. Um, thanks to the Academy of Sciences, we have the Decadal Surveys. The Decadal Survey provides a roadmap for upcoming satellite missions for NASA and USGS, NOAA, on basically what are kind of the high priority missions that are coming up. You can see all of them are based in, in science, um, but there's also a societal benefit to uh, each one of them. So I see there's a lot more opportunities from the NSF community on helping develop these missions. Right now we have five different uh, studies that are going on. One's for um, AACP, this is atmosphere, aerosols, um, cloud and precipitation. And so this is actually a three-year study to basically be able to find out what is the best type of architecture to go in and address this, um, these concerns and moving forward. Another one is mass change, kind of a grace follow-on, follow-on, but we don't want to use the term follow-on with any of these missions because what we're really looking for is what's the next, te the next technology. We just don't want a carbon copy with just an incremental improvement. We're really looking for kind of new game-changing technology. Uh, another one's called SBG, Surface Biology and Geology. And so this this is basically it's going to be a hyperspectral, moderate resolution um, satellite that will, um, what exactly it looks like, we'll find out once the study's um, ultimately complete, but it'll likely be a, a history like mission, but um, with a lot more bells and whistles um, on it. Um, the last one, one I'm responsible for is surface deformation and change. Again, not using a follow-on uh, nomenclature, but it will be a NISAR-like mission. Uh, this one, what the Academy actually recommended, was a mission that really focused on just surface deformation and land surface change. And so with radar, you've got something that will say phase, and then you've got the backscatter. The backscatter is like the radar albedo. The phase allows you to go ahead and measure very subtle. We're talking no need of changes uh, from space of the land surface. And and so SCC was supposed to be only focused on the phase piece for deformation, but at headquarters we went ahead and added on a backscatter piece because with the backscatter you get the ecosystems, you get soil moisture, there's a lot of other things that you can actually get with having a good radiometer, um, but what happens is you need a larger antenna. And so in larger antenna means larger costs. And so there's all the trade space, which we're uh, constantly exploring. So these four decadal surveys, these DO um, missions or studies that have started, this is definitely an opportunity space to get the NSF science community actively involved, engaged with helping design what some of the next satellites are. And I welcome any of my agencies that are up here to also be involved in the USGS is involved in some, and I've got a couple on um, for SDC on the ecosystem side as well. Um, so. Um, um, other um, areas, let's say where we've had, um, let's say some lost opportunities with some of the NSF um, community. Um, David uh, mentioned, uh, David Afghan mentioned the subduction zone. Um, I went to the initial subduction zone um, meeting in uh, Boise a couple years ago. And there's only one or two NASA PIs that were there, and there's no ra NASA representation. I was added on at the very end, and it's just because of my interest, uh, uh, not that um, I was invited by the conveners. I was ultimately allowed a spot at the table to go ahead and talk. But you've got different initiatives that are coming up that, um, or potentially like um, SE4D, of which NASA could actually be play a decent role within. And I, to this day, I still don't know why we were kind of left off the table with that one. Um, so if we kind of think of subduction zones, I David already outlined kind of I, the concern. I mean, we have the big one, the large earthquakes we'll have will come from subduction zones. Um, my program, or a couple of different programs that NASA has quarters invested over $15 million into developing a real-time GNSS tsunami early warning. So uh, in reanalyzing GPS data from the large Japan earthquake, we're actually able to uh, estimate the magnitude of the earthquake, the slip distribution, all within 157 seconds of the, after the earthquake. And so this is just using with GPS, if I'm here and in the earthquake, I move five meters that way, and that takes 10, 15 seconds, we're able to see that. The earth could still be shaking on a seismic uh, perspective, but the displacements have gone off. So it's not, I'm not saying that there's one or the other. I see there's a complementary set of capabilities are out there that both on the seismic side and the genetic side that where um, the NSF with the uh, uh, PPO, Plate Boundary Observatory, UNAFCO, the data, uh, the streams that you're using, you're providing fundamental data that could actually stream in as both a scientific use as well as a societal benefit with the early uh, warning piece. 
Um, so we got uh, the other piece that we've looked at kind of for the subduction zone is seafloor geodesy. Uh, one of the um, elements within my domain is the space geodesy program. And so what we do is basically use satellites to understand the shape of the Earth, how it changes. And with subduction zones, you've got large earthquakes to go on. And any, any way of basically improving our ability to measure the shape of the Earth and how it changes over time, Seafloor geodesy is an area of, um, that is underdeveloped right now. And if we take a look at the Earth, there's a lot more seafloor out there than there is land. So there's a lot of area that it would be best that we go ahead and try to develop better technology. What does NASA do well? Develop new technology. And so I see that's an area of uh, potential collaboration. So I think okay, in wrapping up, I've covered a lot of different areas that are around there. Fundamentally, I do see um, what uh, NSF does and what NASA does, how we uh, treat our research programs. You've got a lot of infrastructure that uh, you use to go ahead and help your scientists address big questions. We build satellites, do the same thing. And I'd like to actually see in the coming years a better marrying of the, uh, the agencies and our capabilities. Because in, in today's budget uh, environment, it's difficult for one agency to be able to do everything. And right now, I'd rather put more money into building the best, cap best performing satellite and then let the community go ahead and work with the data. And you guys op often represent the larger community. And we've got the agencies up here that help us out. So other than that, thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a few questions that the committee talked about prior to, to meeting with you, so we'll go through those and then open them up for, the, for any other questions that the committee has. So Doug, I think you had a question. This sort of goes to the, Mary, you sort of brought up the question of um, uh, sort of that dangerous spot between collaborating and but also being seen as being overlapping. And I, I wondered if you could elaborate on that because that, um, you know, both, you know, the, 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 really the risk of um, either having overlaps and duplication or in avoiding it creating gaps where critical research doesn't get tackled because you're both walking away. So um, in talking to the people that are responsible for where our funding comes from, I think that there's a real push by Congress to see more collaboration between government agencies. The overlap I was talking about is when we go off and play by ourselves, and I have a whole program in geobiology, and NSF has a whole program in geobiology, and they don't understand what is the difference in the flavor of NASA geobiology versus NSF geobiology. So the extent to which um, we can actually develop joint calls or joint programs together um, that demonstrates to those that fund us that we are, are cognizant of what we're each interested in and what the other is interested in and we're not um, funding in a void. And so it's really about showing, like I said, there's lots of uh, support for, for collaborative efforts. And that actually gets around the issue that we get um, brought up that there's overlap or, we're, you know, you guys are double dipping or, you know, we don't know what one, the left side of the left hand is doing. And, and um, so there's a, there's a will in Congress to see more of, of uh, us working together. Okay. Does that answer your question? It, it sort of does, but, oh. but it then it leads to one for Gerald, which is, so when you're talking about subduction zones and fault mechanics, which is of interest to yourselves, USGS and NSF. Yeah. Um, in exactly the same space. So how do you differentiate those three different scientific communities to a what is very often a non-scientific audience? I, on the Hill. Yeah. Uh, I see that there's room for each of the different agencies to go ahead and address it. We, we come at things from different directions. And so um, from NASA's perspective, we're looking at the remote sensing and the technology piece. And so I think some of the stuff that we develop will then be used by the other agencies. And we've got resources that the USGS might not be able to go ahead and they're not going to be able to launch their own satellite to go ahead and look at a back arc spreading and some of the deformation that you might see, but they could go ahead and take advantage of the data that we see, that we collect. So when you've got a large earthquake, they are going to be better attuned to being able to go ahead and interpret some of the imagery that we have. So I see it as more as a partnership moving forward. I don't necessarily see it that we're stepping on each other's toes and moving forward with this. And the other, the other group that's not at the table here is actually NOAA. 
And so NOAA has been left off of a lot of the discussion uh, with uh, SD40. And so I don't know why they've not um, been had a seat at the table as well because um, you, you've got the water that's just the, uh, the overburden, but yet you've got the solid earth that's moving beneath it, and we've got to, be, we have to better characterize that overburden because to me that signal is going through the water, better able to characterize it, and I will be able to do that, be able to uh, get better understanding of what's going on in depth. Okay. Actually, can I add something to that? I think what he's, he's saying, if, if I can, yeah, please. <laughs> is just that it's our job to articulate to Congress what each of our agencies bring that's different and separate that actually contributes to the whole picture. And to explain to them, NSF shouldn't be building satellites. NASA does that. Let, so, let NASA build the satellites and launch them. The data can be collected by those instruments and then shared to researchers at NSF fund. Or, you know, from the perspective of the USGS, you know, USGS has long-term commitment to monitoring things, and so they're they're the keeper of um, Earth. And, and U.S. interior statistics about whether it's water or earthquakes or, you know, and so that is not a job for either NASA, NOAA, or, or NSF. And so it's just really, um, the, the example, at least for my ignorance, the example that you gave to me is a little easier to define than when it's, it's yeah. all intellectual overlap because mm -hmm. we have function dif differences here. Uh, just to add, I mean, this is something that's always coming up and we're always dealing with and having to explain here and there. Um, so there's different ways and different uh, flavors to how, how you, how the question is asked and how it's answered. Um, but, but generally working together allows less overlap or duplication of things and, and more um, integration of things. And I think that's the main main thing that comes off here. Yeah, no, just exactly. I mean, it's, a, it's having those coordination mechanisms in place and demonstrable and where possible actually coming together, you know, basically coming together um, and being able to make this case of how uh, these, you know, the mission space is complementary. Um, and, uh, I mean, I use GSN as an example, but I could, you know, any number of other uh, areas where we've, uh, we've been able to say, look, this is providing both, you know, fundamental understanding, okay, that's NSF space, um, but it also has this set of societal applications. We're never going to be able to, to fund or invest in the kinds of, of really, you know, big picture science that, that NSF has done, um, but we can bring uh, that uh, that societal uh, that societal impact piece that pathway piece um, and uh, and so I, I think uh, I'd, but, but absolutely it's a question that's, that's always going to be there um, you know we just in fact I mentioned the Magneto Telluric <laughs> survey had discussions with the uh, Department of Homeland Security where they were trying to understand how one collection of data could have value for multiple you know multiple agencies but of course it does Right. So. Okay. Great. Hey, thanks, George. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on on Gerald's better marriage uh, comment, and the the context, of course, is that we have uh, our own institutions that we come from, our academic institutions, and we see many of our colleagues who are becoming more and more interested in planetary processes. Um, we have community input. We have about 350 responses from EAR researchers, and many of them are also interested in moving more into planetary studies, planetary analog studies. Um, back at home in our classes, we see students are becoming more and more interested in being able to move back and forth from Earth to planetary studies. So, blue sky, what are, what are some ideas for improving the ability of EAR researchers to move into NASA uh, data and funding and opportunities and vice versa? Excellent question. Um, with upcoming, I'll say the NICE-R mission that we're uh, working on launching, uh, this mission, if we go back to the early days of EarthScope, there was actually four, I mean, is it called a three-legged stool now, but it used to be a four-legged stool. 
of which there was actually an, an, an INSAR mission as a part of EarthScope, where there was actually a fair amount of money that NSF was actually going to go ahead and contribute to developing a nice or a satellite at the time it was called Destiny. And um, that ended up not taking place. And so we've had uh, further discussions with uh, colleagues at NSF um, headquarters in, about having, I'll say, a data processing center where they go ahead and uh, go ahead and add value to the NSF community from NASA data. And so um, since we're cost cap missions, we could only do so much. And so we've got all this data, this all this, I'll say, opportunity space. And that opportunity space goes across all of EAR's um, sciences. And so one way of basically going ahead and making the bridge between it is if NSF was able to go ahead and work with work with NASA in developing some way of being able to have data processing centers where the products that come out of it are of value to the NSF community. And so a lot of what I'm trying to do with, uh, with, uh, my, you know, with NISAR, with the data, is I'm trying to take some of the radar out of the data and just making it, I, what, what makes Landsat so successful, you're able to go and take a look and it's not too different from looking from an iPhone, just imagining it from space. Um, it's more sophisticated than that, but basically it's a pretty picture. Radar's not. And so part of it is what, what I'm trying to do and the directions we're going, phone call that I'm missing right now is part of our uh, Griffin project, getting ready for um, NISAR, where we're specifically doing that. How can we go ahead and take radar data and bring it into a format, into process it to a level that a larger community could work with. And what I'd like to know from the NSF community, what level is needed? When, when, at what's, what's the threshold? What's the tipping point in which your community will start utilizing some of the NASA resources? And what is, what is it going to take? Is it something that I have to do? Or is it moreover, what does NSF need to do to go ahead and get this data into a format in which you're very able to go ahead and really support your science community? We're taking advantage of a lot of the resources that you have, especially in, on the GNSS side. And we greatly appreciate that. And, but when we start coming up with some of these upcoming missions with NISAR and SWAT and these decadal survey ones that I just mentioned, you're going to have terabits of data that are going to be coming down. Um, and how do we work with it? And so instead of trying to come up with what's the next network that we need to develop, how can we better take advantage of what resources that are actually are up there? And so that would be something I'd love to actually see an NSF, a uh, NASA partnership working towards identifying what can we do to better utilize the resources and the capabilities that we already have on orbit or suborbital with our aircraft. I'll go to Kate and then to Catalina and then Bill. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so you talked about all of these data and uh, cloud uh, ap approaches for dealing with the data and cloud tools for looking at those data. That's one end of the spectrum of the kind of data sets that the earth sciences community uses. And the other end of the spectrum is measurements on the ground, in the ground, um, uh, samples, geochemical. I mean, it's very, it, those, those data sources are very diverse. And so part of one of the things that I'm wondering if you could speak to is, are there ways that you can see forward of marrying with cyber infrastructure insights that you have from the mass quantities of data and approaches that you're using that EAR can learn from in terms of cyber infrastructure from everything from computer models to uh, geochemical data to samples to seism seismograms? You perfectly said. The, basically, um, with the, the satellite um, data that we have, the, the ground validation, the calibration validation piece is essential. And so NASA does not just collect data without having any, any validation uh, with it. And so uh, we've actually, for NISAR alone, we've had, I think, seven different workshops where we've reached out to the USDA, the USGS, multiple arms of the, or groups within the USGS, um, US Forest Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, all with basically trying to work on developing better in-situ networks. 
the fact that what's running right now is uh, my airborne sensor called the UAV SAR. It's flying every 12 days, AM, PM, um, to go ahead and collect data over a series of sites in the central U.S. And we're working with the U.S. Um, VA with regard to collecting soil moisture data, in situ ground data. And so this is stuff where we are partnering with a number of the different federal agencies to go ahead and take things next step further. But I think we can only go so far, and this is really where the, the academic community has a lot to go ahead and contribute here with their, uh, well, I'll say your armies of graduate students and postdocs, ability to go ahead and collect data. Um, we have no problem distributing it because uh, basically any project that we fund, we have an open data policy that you've got to be able to go ahead and um, gain access to. But we welcome contributions from other agencies with the ability to go ahead and improve our on-ground um, capabilities. We don't claim to be geochemists. That's not our specialty. But we can say here's where the spectral response is based on whatever chemistry. So, so that's your side with the, with the planetary. They don't have any ground truth. Well, maybe on Mars. <laughs> but anyway, so this is an open area that I would love to be able to go and explore more. Right now with NISAR, we just um, just selected the new science team, and it's all about calibration validation. Those who are on the science team have um, ground validation capabilities that they're contributing to the mission. I'm going to add something from our side. So I think one thing people need to learn from NASA is that we have a lot of data morgues. We collect massive amounts of data and it goes places to die and no one ever uses it again. And that's, that's really horrible given the investments that we have made. And so we're better about that. You just heard um, Gerald actually talk about the, the newer programs, but we have lots of old data that we've collected. And in planetary, we have the planetary data system that has massive amounts of data coming off of our satellites and our rovers and um, and it's been it's a huge infrastructural um, uh, sink of funding and I think this is a thing that agencies struggle with is do we actually support the data that we've already collected to make sure that it's accessible, that it's, it's available, that there are algorithms to mine it, that it's in the right format, or do we actually continue to fund people to collect more and more data? And so I think this is something we're all, it's on my list of things to bring up that we as agencies need to collaborate um, on how to actually make, because we don't want to keep recollecting things, and there's a lot of, of stuff that's out there already. Um, also, we actually do collect samples, and so we're trying. Cesar was the program, I think, out of Columbia for basically barcoding all samples so that was available, so we don't have to send people to the same places over and over again. Or, um, and so we're trying to do some of that, but again, it all comes down to. Do we fund those programs or do we continue to solicit for people to do um, the analysis of or collection of new materials and analysis and interpretation of, of new and exciting um, uh, ideas? So, Carolina, I'll just add a, this just, you know, there's a tremendous hunger right now in the, in the AIML, uh, you know, community for these, you know, training, training sets, training data sets, and uh, it just, it, underscores and we have all of these sort of real-time applications for the data but um, especially in the seismic arena with um, with the uh, iris the data archive center and uh, with the NAPCO on the on the ge uh, geodesy side I mean the the importance and uh, you know and significance of these data sets is just going to continue to explode these are on ongoing uh, ongoing needs needs we haven't even imagined um, so I have two separate questions uh, for the NASA people and for uh, David Applegate of uh, USGS. Uh, the first is related to what George asked in terms of the planetary Earth, you know, how we go from one thing to another. And one question I had on the better marriage, is there support for a joint, say, EAR, NASA astrobiology exoplanet program, right? Because issues of planetary formation are an impact you know, giant impacts are very tied to Earth structure today. And yet that's not something that, you know, you could just say send to EAR with the plant, that planetary formation side. So is there any mechanism or support for actually having joint 
uh, programs, if that's possible. So that's my question for the NASA people. My question for USGS is that you mentioned in terms of hazard geomagnetic storms and how that space weather. Um, but I wonder if there's also room in there, because we heard from the AGS uh, program manager uh, or the directorate, to actually think a little bit more broadly, you know, because that is the interaction with the magnetic field that is internally generated, right? And all the changes that are happening. And so to think more broadly about issues that are related to the Earth's interior that are very important, um, but that can take advantage, you know, of that sort of societal and then technological impact. Last person, yeah, so before I forget it, okay. <laughs> um, no, I mean, this is a tremendous, this is a, an incredibly exciting time um, for for the, the broader sort of space weather enterprise, uh, this recognition that um, it is the bringing together of of the data, not only about the, the, you know, the solar activity, the magnetic response to it, but now incorporating what we know about the Earth itself to be able to then translate that into uh, E-field models. Models. And now, you, now you've moved into what you really need to understand in order to understand whether we're talking about something that is going to just have a, you know, a couple of days visit to the dark ages or whether we're going to be spending four months there. Um, so I think that uh, acknowledgement that this sort of multiple multiple data sets everywhere from the from the sun to to the uh, uh, to the composition of the Earth itself. Linking those together is what's going to get us to, you know, and, and whether it's the external driver with the magnetic storms, whether it's issues relating to, uh, you know, um, human-induced hazards, let's say, with the, the EMP. Um, so it, it's a really exciting time for that, and I think there is that recognition. You need to bring all of those uh, sources of knowledge, very disparate sources of knowledge. Some of there. it might be very fundamental science about dynamo generation, uh, right? Absolutely. And that, and and so so cross cross agency, cross directorate. Process. That's right. And there's this. Um, I mean, and, and then again, that comes back to having these effective coordination mechanisms. So in this case, the the uh, the swarm, the space weather um, uh, operations research and mitigation, I guess it is working group um, that brings those different agencies together. So they have a place to to have those conversations, to, to look at what their different pieces of the puzzle are is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So so um, I was going to say that at least within NASA, from my perspective in planetary, we've had to convince their scientists that Earth was a planet. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so in NASA, the planetary formation, the composition of the Earth, and some of the fundamental planetary processes are are housed in the planetary sciences division. Um, and how Earth is functioning now is more Earth science, and observing that from from space is really what our Earth science group does. And so, I think probably Gerald and I see ourselves closer to NSF than we see ourselves to each other, um, because of the things that you mentioned, understanding the dynamo and the creation of magnetic fields, and therefore why can Mars at some point have had an atmosphere and no longer has an atmosphere, which is that, you know, what's the relationship there? I mean, all that stuff is very important. In terms of getting a group together um, within NASA, so one of the things that I did, I was responsible for Nexus, which is um, picking a topic that no one fully owned, which was exoplanets, so sort of trying to get away from the turf of planetary Earth, the sun, uh, the universe, and saying, okay, everybody has something to contribute to this topic. Nobody really owns it because we haven't had that much to look at until now, mm -hmm. but we all have something and an investment and, and knowledge that we can bring to it. And so you mentioned exoplanets. I think from my perspective, it's something that's un unifying 
NASA and could in fact unify most of our agencies because again, if we want to understand any planet anywhere else, we have to understand, I mean, everybody up here is an earth scientist and are taking care of some part of the earth. So maybe there should be an interagency something on exoplanets um, with everybody's role sort of articulated well so that no one thinks that we're just asking for more money for nothing important to do, but to actually um, leverage what we all do. So I, I, again, so that was an example, but I think that's a generalization of ways that we can all come together as agencies when we have something out there that we're, we all have something to contribute to. Before it was climate change, maybe it's exoplanets, you know, something like that I think can work. Okay, and I'm going to dive more into the mechanisms. Uh, for joint solicitations. Um, I've been at NASA headquarters for about five years now, and I've seen and I've heard a couple different uh, ways of which doing joint solicitations. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Paula Bontempi, um, oversaw a very large multi-agency solicitation in which a each agency went ahead and contributed different amounts, and they held a joint panel. And so each agency ended up funding their parts of each of the different proposals. So I think that is one in member in which you basically have three, four different agencies all contributing for a much larger uh, picture. Um, another one that I worked with, with uh, I guess uh, Greg Anderson within um, EAR when uh, he was overseeing a lot more of the, the air sciences, we were looking at kind of a geohazard piece. And so he was looking at a $15 million, and at the time we had about uh, $5 million, of, which go ahead and contribute to a true joint solicitation. We ended up never quite pursuing it because our funding did not quite line up with the timeline that he had. It had come to us a couple years earlier and uh, solicited the idea that we were able to go ahead and reposition funding such that it would work down in the future. But that was not definitely an opportunity to be able to go ahead and do it. What we've also have done, I think, fairly successful is where you basically have had solicitations that point to each other. So an NSF uh, solicitation that points to NASA and then likewise. And so each agency does its own, but then the program managers, program scientists from each of the agencies get together and basically see which ones uh, collectively uh, to move forward on. And so that's another way of doing this. Um, I also will go back to the sub subduction zone 4D. When I went to that workshop as one of the only NASA people there, I actually saw a couple things there that um, in basically how they were doing network design and so forth. It's just one of those things, let's throw, let's throw instruments out and let's see what they collect, kind of a serendipitous science. And when I design a satellite, we go through a lot of rigorous testing and what science do we want to go ahead and collect from it? What ground spacing do we need and so forth? And so there's actually two, we had a Rosa solicitation last year and there's one out on the street right now that was inspired by me attending the, that a particular a meeting, basically trying to do network design. It was also um, to help out UNAVCO with basically the question of, we've got to go ahead and parse down some of the uh, GNSS sites. What, what's some of the trade-offs? So it's as uh, solicitations out on the street right now. So we've got this in number where you've got, um, where like Apollo on Tempe, where they've had multiple agencies on down to joint solicitations, to ones where you got pointers together, and then you've got ones that are inspired by each other, like what we just did with this Rosa solicitation which trying to do um, network design optimization. So I've seen that in my five years at NASA headquarters, and um, what I do understand is the joint solicitations, they take a lot of work, and uh, but if the payoff is there, it's worth it. I have a, a couple um, simple uh, questions. Um, I want to catch the first thing you said when you sat down. I want to make sure I understood it. I think you said that um, it's difficult for people who want to work with NASA data to get funding from NSF. Did I understand that correctly? I've had is that your perception? Yeah, th th that, that's my perception. I don't know how true it is or not. Okay. Um, I know that on my um, NASA reviews, if basically if a something basically I'll say looks very NSF or like a recycled NSF that does not have much remote sensing in it, we're not going to fund it. And so there's a perception on my part, and I'd love to be corrected if it's true. Basically, if there's a um, proposal to NSF that has a very strong remote sensing element to it, 
that it does not often get funded. And, that's just and the perception is because NASA should fund this because it's using NASA data. Is that the perception? I, that would be I, my interpretation. I'm, I'm saying this aloud because there's a certain person sitting in the room hearing this. So, <laughs> so, and, and, and I, again, I, I might be walking out on thin ice and I'll sink okay. through and into the frigid water, but that's the perception that I've had, and I've had nothing to change that. Okay. And so I think there's other responses think, here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I mean, uh, to be fair, we all get a limited pot of money and we have to make the best decisions for our program. And we actually often do look for reasons to kick it over the yeah. fence to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. And so I certainly have had someone come to me and clearly it's a recycled NSF. There's a broader impact statement. Sometimes they even forget to remove <laughs> NSF. Yeah. And, uh, and it's because somebody, and when I've asked them about it, it's because they were told to come to us. And I've certainly done similar things. So I think that it's most successful when we work together and everybody. So I've also done, I did an ideas lab with NSF. And so we ponied up $6 million up or no, $8 million each up front. And then the selections, you know, we were committed to the solicitation. The selections got made. Nobody was saying, no, it's yours. No, it's mine. I want that one. It worked much better if there's a collaboration at the beginning with a clear understanding of what you want to fund instead of trying to figure out who's going to take care of, um, you know, what part of it. So, yeah. I, I would just add that um, it's not. I don't think it'd be right to say, I, that has not been my perception in some of these uh, joint solicitations that I've been in and, and in, in my single, it's when it's joint. not joint, not joint, is that if there's a lot of remote sensing in it, that nobody's going to kick it out for that. But they'll kick it out if it looks like a recycled NASA or NSF proposal in that it doesn't actually address what's in okay. the solicitation. Okay. And that's what happens. It's not really because, okay. oh, they're doing too much remote sensing. It's because they haven't tailored and explained why they fit this program, you see? So uh, I think that's a misconception. Okay. The, the second part of that, and I have another short question, um, is uh, there is a, going all the way back to the Bros report 20 years ago now, almost, um, there was an expression of saying that NSF should have greater uh, interest in planetary research. And yet there's been a decision, I think, uh, because of funds to say, well, that's going to be NASA's role. Has, has that, have you, do you, have you guys sort of tried to talk across that at all? Because as it's expressed down this way, there's just a growing interest in the planets. Um, and is this, a, is this a barrier that just is going to be, or is there, is there worth of bringing this issue up, do you think? Again, limited funds, yeah. you can only do so much, but in our decadal surveys, I mean, planetary science was, you know, quote unquote, invented at NASA and it's our purview and we mostly have that responsibility and there's very little funding from NSF on that. We also split up the telescopes. We're in charge of the space-based telescopes and ground-based telescopes okay. are the responsibility of NSF, okay. Okay. even though our communities could use both. Yeah. I, mean, so, I understand this practicality. I'm just curious where you stand on that. Oh, where I stand? Well, not, I don't well, know you personally, but the way they... Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, my stand is much re well, reasonable. You're living, in both, <laughs> you're living in both worlds, right? Yeah, and, and I, I actually, it, it makes it very... Those sorts of things that you're uh, bringing yeah. up actually make are what makes it difficult for us to do the best science yeah. that we can do is because then you have to think about you kludge to get well get some time on a on a ground telescope from NSF and then something from a space telescope and then we'll get some modeling from PSD and that just again doesn't make a lot of sense okay. so, but there is that person that reality a short question for you which is something very curious was launched a couple of years ago um, called the landslide hazard assessment for situational awareness which I just happened to bump into when I, I, I will tell you I was on the uh, the decadal survey um, committee, so I was poking around and figuring out what's going on. And what is that about? I mean, it's not. An, I haven't seen any announcement about it. It's just automatically reporting landslide risk around the world on a regular basis. And what, what's the intent or what's the plan for that? The, uh,
if I understand which program you're talking yeah. about, this is led by our scientist uh, at Goddard, Dahlia Kishbaum. And so what she's done is she's uh, combined a couple different of our satellites. Yeah, that's right. The precipitation data yeah, G- and then... GPM. Yeah. So global precipitation measurement. Yeah. And so basically... Um, if you've got a lot of rain coming to steep topography with the right, right. geology, right. what's the likelihood of landslides? They're going to go up. If you've got sure. not a lot of precipitation coming into an area that had uh, fires, well, maybe we'll have a slightly elevated uh, thing. So basically what she was trying to do is come up with an automated way of taking a look at here is the atmospheric data that's coming in. How could we go ahead and apply it to some sort of geology type uh, piece? And so I can say that this has been very successful. Um, how, how do you mean that's successful? It, it's been successful because other agencies, there's some three-letter agencies that um, <laughs> behind the dark curtain that have actually brought her algorithms in and are running 24-7 to provide situational awareness for our military. Ah, okay. And so it's basically uh, they need to know, can we move troops through here? What okay. type of um, things will, will go on? And so with that, they're basically using whatever information that's out there. So if you know, here's precipitation, here's soil moisture. So what's the ground conditioning? If it's dry, you have more accommodation space when the rain hits. Sure. If it's wet, it's going to shut off. And be able to bring that in with just topography and geology. And you're able to go ahead and start getting a better sense of where your tanks get stuck in the mud or not. Right. Uh, the, the reason I ask is that it, it was it was just sort of appeared, and there's been very little said about it. And I was trying to figure out what the and there's no um, I've never seen any assessment as to whether any of the predictions actually happened um, in that sense. So I'm just trying to figure out what that. And the reason I bring it up is we have a um, a role to think about yeah. uh, in our recommendations at uh, ER, and there's a has it says in ER's mission that we should worry about hazards, and this is a this, I think what you have there is the elements of the future. Yes. Right? High resolution topographic data would come in and make this better. Yes. Uh, the high resolution precipitation data and a maybe more mechanistic model, I think what I see in that out, uh, effort is the, uh, where things are going. Yeah. Um, Dolly is one of the, I guess, presidential fellowships, so one of the young investigators. And so uh, she took her funding, and this is one okay. of the projects that uh, she came out of it. So it's not, as far as I know, it's not a directed NASA project or an award. This is something that she moved forward with. And um, uh, I know that she's had a lot of outreach with a lot of the Central American uh, countries, um, Costa Rica and so forth, because it actually has done a fairly, good, fairly decent job in some of the Central America uh, countries. I was in point here, that's a natural link to the yeah, it, 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 thing. I'm curious whether you've made any links. Yeah, no, uh, Dahlia has, uh, she and uh, Jonathan Goddard, who's our landslide mm-hmm. program coordinator, um, they have uh, they have collaborated. In fact, um, we uh, just uh, um, uh, just got funding for, uh, our, we have a longstanding partnership with USAID for the Volcano Disaster Assistance mm-hmm. Program and also the Earthquake Disaster Assistance Team. We've just incorporated a landslide piece into that. And uh, so that's going to give us some additional bandwidth for some of the international activity okay. and very much going to make sure that that's, you know, we're, we're partner, partnering with, with Dolly and others um, so we can, yeah, basically see how far you can push those kinds of capabilities while at the same time acknowledging that there still is, um, it just depends on what you need for the, for the use that you have and how do you marry that up with the ground truth and everything else and do that kind of assessment to the point where you've got confidence in your ability to use that for societal decision making. Okay, I think we yeah. should move on. We have several more yeah. questions. Leho? Yeah. Um, to, a question to, to you, Gerald. I think you sort of pointed out um, that some of the more recent missions um, have sort of improved kind of community science outreach efforts. And, I, you know, I w- I'm familiar with this MAP mission in that, you know, Vanessa Escobar was um, a liaison um, for that program and Molly Brown. Um, and there were a number of sort of working groups associated with this MAP mission that had to do with CalVal field campaigns science applications. Um, I guess one question about that, that seems like a potential vehicle, because it sounds like what you you communicated to us was maybe that perhaps um, because of the the complicated nature of a lot of these data sets, there's maybe um, a 
lack of understanding in the in the broader community about how those data might be brought to bear on advancing the fundamental science. Um, but it seems like the um, those working groups and um, liaisons as well as the science definition teams that get formed if there was maybe some thoughtful interactions with NSF that that might be a way to sort of enhance those communica communications such that PIs kind of understood what the nature of the data were, what their uncertainties were, you know, what assumptions go into the, the algorithm processing. And so I guess the question to you is, you know, are there, have there been efforts when you've stood up those working groups, science definition teams and liaisons um, at doing outreach to NSF and its broader PI community, or what might that look like? Uh, great set of questions there. Um, I'm going to go back in time, say maybe 10 years ago. Um, how NASA launched missions is basically science only. We basically build in science, it launches, we start collecting data. Oh, and uh, yeah, we've got applications, we've got a societal relevant. It's an afterthought. And starting in, I think it was 2008, we had the, um, the first actually applications workshop. It was for a mission called uh, Destiny, which is now NYSAR, the one that I'm uh, overseeing. We had the applications workshop in Sacramento where we started looking at what is the end user community that's beyond science. And so we know what the scientists want, but if you are an emergency responder, how can you take advantage of the data? Or if you're a farmer, how can you go ahead and start doing it? So that workshop and the report that came out of it has actually been kind of used as a blueprint forward within a NASA Earth Sciences to go ahead and start actually adding applications on. So now I'll fast forward to um, today. All the missions that we're working on, especially the Decatur surveys, has an applications lead on it, and applications are now embedded in the early stages of the mission and of the development. So this is being able to go ahead and take it to um, the societal relevance. Not that we're necessarily looking at how we're going to check, like, change the mission itself, but what can we do? What, what are some of the key things the application community needs? So a couple of the people up here, basically low latency data, high resolution data. Um, the ability to go ahead and get the data off the satellite. Most scientists, I mean, yeah, you can click, come back 30 days later and they'll still, still be happy with this, uh, the data. They could go ahead and uh, work with it. If you just have the Ridgecrest earthquake and you're basically trying to figure out where you want to put your GPS site in so you catch the post-seismic transients associated with it, you're going to want that data off the satellite as quick as possible so that you go ahead and uh, optimize the network. And so we're looking at basically how to go ahead and come up with a balance. If I want data off a satellite really quickly, it costs a lot of money. And so do I want to basically invest in a, a satellite, the teacher system, satellite to satellite uh, downlink, which costs a lot more than basically uh, you've got to wait five hours until we fly over the next downlink station. Those are all things that we work on developing. If you're NOAA and you're tracking uh, NOAA goes, you basically need the satellite to satellite download. But the compromise is maybe you're collecting slightly lower resolution data. And so since we're built on science, we're basically trying to look at how can we maximize our science while uh, still being able to go ahead and serve the, the broader community. So as the NASA missions move forward, you're going to see applications much more fully embedded into the mission and the mission uh, planning. For NYSAR, we've actually had seven different workshops. Uh, for SWAT, Surface Water Ocean Topography, another mission that I'm associated with, we've had two or three different workshops specifically reaching out to the applications uh, community. So I think Moving forward, you're going to actually see this, this marriage there where we're able to go ahead and uh, work with it. When I take a look at the budget on the research analysis side versus the applied sciences, it's about a 10 to 1. So the research has got a much higher budget than the applications piece. But when you're doing research, you can have a lot of different research that may or may not have societal benefit at the end of the day. And so some science works, we all know, and some does not. Some advances are fundamental understanding of fault physics or whatever that does not have a something that will help an emergency responder at the end of the day. And so that's kind of the budget, kind of the balance that we have right now with it. But we are definitely moving forward with it. Um, and as for the, the science team and li liaisons, uh, uh, NYSAR actually has an applications lead. We've got a solid earth, ecosystem, cryosphere, and an applications lead. Their job is to go ahead and help manage the uh, applications piece for NYSAR. 
Okay. Can, Tanya? can I make, I just want to respond to something you said. I just want to put this out there. Sometimes people talk about NSF scientists and NASA scientists, and at least in my program, they're the same. And when we do science definition teams for the missions that we plan in planetary, um, they're coming from the best people that do the work that we're interested in. And so don't start that. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 that, I, that, I did want to underscore that and say, say with NISAR, over half of the NISAR science team is academic. And so um, we actually have a balance of, uh, I'll say NASA funded scientists, but um, all of our leads, so basically four, each of the, the four, actually three of the four leads are from academia and across the country. Tanya? Oh. I think this is mostly for Mary. I'll really re-ask the same question that was about planetary, but about geobiology or astrobiology, whatever you want to call it, because there is a lot of community input on the importance of understanding the origins of life, habitability, and this is the EAR input. So how do you see you as you or the program? Uh, can you give me some specific examples of interactions with, say, NSF geobiology, is it mostly through people, or what could we do on the EAR side to maybe take advantage of? I would love help from you. Um, about six or seven years ago, maybe, we actually, at uh, the biennial meeting of the Astrobiology Science Conference, um, we had a joint meeting, a joint workshop with NSF when um, Oh gosh, I've now forgotten her name, just a second. Um, um, Marilyn Fogel was actually rotating and she had the whole community cut together and it was very clear that there was a lot in common. Um, and again, I, I, my impression at that time was that is a, I mean, we all feel that we don't get enough money, fair enough, but the pr program officer that was running that felt that there wasn't um, sufficient um, funding to do what she wanted to do in her own program plus do something together. So I think, again, for me the real answer is, and I'm happy to, to kick money in to, um, to have us work together because a lot of our scientists go to both places. So. Paul? Hi, Paul Olson. Um, I'm a member of the committee. Um, I have uh, two, quest two sets of questions, uh, one for, for Mary and one for, and a couple for David. Mary, um, relating back to, to what Tanya was just talking about in terms of, uh, of exoplanets, um, does, uh, does astrobiology look at exoplanet habita uh, habitability as modulated by solar system gravitational interactions, so st stability of solar systems, for example? planets turning upside down, falling to their sun, you know? Yeah, so, um, so astrobiology has focused mostly on things that, the processes from the moment of the Big Bang that lead to a habitable planet, mm -hmm. whether it's Earth or a planet somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, we pull in people from all sorts of disciplines. Our astrophysics colleagues are the people that would actually address that specifically, but we're doing, we're, we're um, it, it, astrobiology is a selling program in the sense that I usually have to sell people that basically all of you are astrobiologists, you don't yet, yet know it because I need everything that's in your brain in order for me to understand the things that are tasked with my program, to, the questions we're tasked with answering. And so the simple answer to your question is absolutely. Um, and we usually fund it through programs at NASA. Potentially, we could do this with uh, programs at NSF as well, who fund people who are the, the experts in that area to start thinking about what comes after that or what comes during that that would affect habitability. So does that? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, I know at, um, SSW has uh, Which I used to run. You know, programs. Yeah. That, that, and, and, and solicitations uh -huh. that, that deal with that, but I was wondering about the intersection with, uh, with astrobiology, which I think you answered. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much. It's very exciting to hear, hear you all. So, so like exoplanets are super exciting. I think they're super exciting too. If they last long enough to have something grow on them. Um, well, well, um, so uh, David, uh, I, as an old, a little bit of an old-time 
geologists, I'm very interested in, in mapping, and I've had students who are interested in mapping, and USGS was the premier mapping place. Um, is there much going on in the way of geological mapping and improving maps uh, at the moment at the USGS? And, and let me just say a little bit more about that before you answer the question, because I, I getting access now uh, largely very easily through the national map through LIDAR. I notice that it's possible to improve mapping and get at some fundamental geological questions through mapping at order of magnitude better quality and speed than was possible by using LIDAR. So, so does that still exist? Are there, are there interactions with NSF? For, so, there, there's something called code geomap for students. Is that still around? Do you do that anymore? So I can provide a partial answer, and then um, I certainly could, could get some additional from our, so our National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program, it's a, uh, again, established by Congress, it's a very much a partnership with the state geological surveys mandated essentially half the funding goes to the states. Um, EDMAP is uh, also mandated, it's a small percentage um, that uh, directly funds, you know, projects with universities as well. Um, there is a big push right now to um, to take what has been, I think, kind of a, a sleepy area in terms of some of the investments that we've made in recent years in sort of foundational mapping. Um, uh, it's called Earth MRI, includes um, investments in geologic mapping, uh, geophysical surveys, as well as uh, a building on what has been a very active area, which is the 3D elevation program, or 3DEP, um, and the efforts to collect high-resolution LIDAR for the nation. So combining all of those and uh, focused specifically or sort of prioritized and targeted um, by uh, areas of uh, critical mineral potential. So that is, uh, that is, it was a $10 million initiative this past year, I think, or $9 million, I think it's $10 million this year. That's the first big investment or new investment in our geologic mapping as well as in the geophysical surveys um, in, uh, you know, in, in some time. Um, there has been tremendous progress on the 3 uh effort, and that's not just USGS, we're, we're sort of are the, the hub for that, but a number of different agencies investing that. I know Alaska went from essentially, uh, you know, uh, having maps with you know mountains in the wrong place to to now using actually uh, uh, SAR technology uh, instead of INSAR they call it IFSAR but uh, um, they're now at I think something like 96 percent they've just let the contracts for the for the final data collection so we're going to have you know quite quite good resolution mapping for all of Alaska again another one of those sort of enabling capabilities um, I think for the domestic U.S. it's more like sort of on the order of 50 percent and the biggest obstacle has been um, uh, in uh, the public lands, ironically, since we sit in the Department of the Interior. Um, but the Earth MRI effort should help us to make progress in that arena. So, so I think there is some uh, real opportunity there. I know there's been uh, partnerships with um, EAR in a couple of different areas. One is uh, that I think is really promising is NSF has the Pathways program, and that makes it possible for grad students to uh, work uh, not just at, at you know on the university campus, but also to work with other agencies. And we're really excited about that. Um, I think I did I get the name of that right? Yeah. Oh. The name of the program is Intern, and it's for graduate students to go to other uh, organizations and get professional development, and NSF pays for their time. At intern. The intern. Program. Yeah. yeah, just what I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, that's been really positive. The other thing where um, NSF has been investing jointly with us is what we call the Powell Center, and that's an opportunity to bring uh, scientists together to look at existing data sets and, and to really mine those and, and work on them. So I think there have been and, uh, and, and this is sort of you know moving outside of our hazards mission into some of these other missions. I think there have been some really positive developments. Is there an intersection with um, 
with uh, groundwater hazards and the, and the mapping. Uh, for example, arsenic in, in embedded sedimentary systems and its intersection with massive populations. Yeah, in terms of the, the I know the state surveys did a, a survey um, uh, several years ago, and they really looked at what were the primary drivers for geologic mapping, and water resource issues were, were far and away the, the dominant. I mean, ha hazards was there, um, but the, the whole uh, sort of realm of, gra of, of groundwater related issues was, was a very significant part of that. That. Um, and, uh, you know, we have our environmental health mission area in particular has been very interested in trying to, to, to do interdisciplinary science, bringing together the, you know, geologic aspects with the toxicological aspects in our, our ecosystems mission, along with our, of course, our traditional strengths in the water arena um, to try to, uh, to try to get at some of those issues. So. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Bruce has been waiting patiently, so Bruce. Yeah, patience, patience isn't really part of my character. But <laughs> this, uh, this is also for you, I guess, David, and ironically, it is about the USGS NSF internships. Um, and the, the, I guess the question, perhaps addressed to you too, Lena, is, is, is this the start of something potentially bigger and going beyond graduate students? Because I think one of the issues has been in the past money, and it's not an absence of money, but it's the issue of when money is vested in one federal institution, but potentially being used in the context of employees or students from another, you know, and I've encountered this on numerous occasions when it's an irritant more than anything else because it's often very small sums of money that don't justify for large formal agreements. Yes. So from our perspective, it's up to the student and sometimes the, the mentor graduate advisor to figure out the relationship with the other entity yeah. where the student is going to go and figure out the mechanisms on, on what the hosting entity needs to do to allow access to the individual. And the first part of your question, if this is, this is something larger, as far as I know, it's not. It's more about enhancing graduate education and providing students with an opportunity to test a different environment than academics. Because as we know, we tend to educate students to be in academic environments and we recognize that most of the graduate students are not being employed by universities. Mm 